sure if she's going to turn the light on or not. I think the camera's on, but... Good evening and welcome to the Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting for the evening of April 22nd, 2014. If you'd all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Carol, could you call the roll, please? Ms. Auglis, here. Mr. Buffard. Here. Mr. DuPont. Here. Mr. Fellows. Mr. Mazur. Here. Mr. McGee. Here. Mr. Paul. Here. Uh, with the absence of Mr. Fellows, Mr. McGee is a voting member this evening. Our next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes of March 10, 2014. I move to approve. Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? And we have one abstention. Our next item this evening, Tr Trillium Place, formerly known as Woods Edge Subdivision, Woods Edge Scarborough LLC requests a preliminary subdivision review for 11 single family lots off Ash Swamp Road. Mr. Chase. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as board members will recall, this application has been before you um, at least once before and actually was scheduled to be heard at your March 31st meeting and was tabled at the applicant's request so they could have uh, more time to address some of staff's questions. Um, at, as board members may recall, recall, staff previously had some concerns regarding the spillway design of the stormwater pond at the terminus of the proposed roadway, particularly the impact it may have had on abutting neighbors, as well as street lighting and open space identification. The applicant has made some modifications to the plans um, and presented those in their proposal. This time, staff is relatively comfortable that those items have been addressed. Um, we'll have received comments from uh, Mr. Wendell, town's engineer, as well as Woodard and Curran, our peer review engineers, um, who raised a couple of concerns. Mr. Wendell um, identified the design of the access off the hammerhead, and Woodard and Curran uh, primarily had concerns with the uh, results of the plume analysis. Particularly, there seemed to be a bit of overlap, and just look for a little bit of um, clarification from the applicant on that item. Um, other than those items, staff is, uh, has no further comment this time. Thank you, Jay. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, we're here this evening uh, representing the uh, group of individuals who are with us who are going to be the uh, developers for this particular project, they're the owners of the property. Um, I'm also joined by uh, Travis Letelier, who is our, one of our engineers, who if you have any technical questions, I uh, probably should be able to answer them for you, otherwise I will do my best toward that end. And uh, again, because the board is uh, fairly familiar with this project, having seen it originally many years ago under a different developer and then uh, took a respite for a while during the recession and is now back again, and then you saw it uh, somewhat recently here as well, so you're probably very familiar with what we've got. Toward the end of my very brief presentation, I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have or any comments, and then we can go from there. Um, in the interest of brevity, I'd like to be able to just give you a quick overview of what we're looking at. Uh, essentially, we're looking at a property that is on the Saco line, which is our road. Uh, this is Ash Swamp Road, and uh, we're proposing to be able to come off of this. Originally, uh, we were off of uh, this in the section, this section right in here, but we closed that off. There was a fair amount of wetlands disturbance that we were looking at in this particular area. <clears throat> and uh, given that uh, 
of the owners of the property when they acquired this property, which was not part of Ashwamp, which was not part of the original development, and now is. We've been able to merge the title of those two lots, create the roadway you see it. All the lots uh, have, there are no, as far as the lots themselves, there are no impacts as far as the wetlands are concerned regarding the building envelopes and the houses that would go in them. There is a fairly minor impact of wetlands as far as the roadway is concerned, uh, but we've, as you can see, we've snaked the roadway around to the extent that it is absolutely <coughs> minimal. We've got a deep permit that uh, is on its way. It's actually already been reviewed, but we don't have it back yet. We will certainly have it before the final. Uh, we will not be here for the final until we actually have that in hand. Uh, notwithstanding that fact, the other things that Jay mentioned are uh, mostly labeling changes, but I will go through those uh, in here in just a moment. As far as the overall layout is concerned, you can see on your plans that you have before you and then on the presentation sheet, we've got one house on the property that already exists. We're incorporating that with element. All these other lots is as you see them. There is a small cemetery that's right down here. One of the questions from the comments was you should be prepared to um, create a, some type of buffer immediately around that, not only the, the legal buffer, obviously, but some type of physical buffer, uh, which we will certainly do. Uh, there was a, uh, an issue earlier where we kind of crowded the uh, building envelope in with that, but we've since uh, subsequently redesigned that, so uh, the cemetery is far away from where the house would typically go. We are looking at uh, private water and sewer in this particular area, so all the lots have wells and septic systems on them. Everything has passed according to um, uh, Scarborough statutes. Uh, it will uh, entertain any questions if you've got uh, those uh, questions about the, uh, the well and the water, or the water and the septic later on. There was a question about stormwater that Jay had brought up uh, down in the area of Lot 1. Originally, there's a pond right here, a wet pond, uh, that will be right in this area for detention or retention of stormwater. Uh, there was a question before because uh, there was no specific device that was uh, treating the overflow of that and when the water, if and when the water overflowed in a 100-year storm event, it would typically go where it, wherever it would go. We've uh, heard the concerns of one of the abutters, and what we've done is we've literally culverted this water, the storm water now, so that in the event of an overflow, which is highly unlikely in a 100-year storm event, but they do happen, um, and toward that end, if it's a magnanimous event and we do have an overflow, it will actually be captured uh, beneath the, the pavement and in a culvert system that will come out here to a swale system that's actually going to put it where the water typically would go anyway, which is in the wetland area. Uh, so that should be taken care of as far as any of those issues are concerned. There was also a question about lighting at the end. We've got an LED light uh, pursuant to uh, the town's regulations that basically in a light position, ambient light that tends to glow around you by focusing the light straight down in the end of the road. So we'll have a, uh, uh, a cobalt style light at the at Ashland Road to be able to turn in as is required. Uh, and then uh, for safety's sake down at the end, but there will be nothing in between. That's the orientation of the plan. Uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, There's no turnout issues. Um, the area that is Right in this section, uh, one of the comments was that we would like to be able to, on the plan as well as physically on the site, delineate that area as the buffer from the wetlands so that even during the construction phase, while no houses obviously or any other structures would go there, sometimes <coughs> contractors tend to get in there with some fairly big equipment and they kind of do wherever they have to go to be able to uh, uh, create or uh, build the driveways, the houses, the extra shed pools, et cetera. For this and Scarborough many years ago came up with the uh, idea of pinning or uh, fencing or somehow marking with hard physical characteristics the actual end of a lot or the buffer between that, the upland buffer between that and the actual wetland area. So we have shown that on this plan. Jim, is the town engineer, has suggested you might actually want to uh, hatch this area so that on the plans there's no confusion by anybody from contractors to homeowners as to where their property ends, despite the fact that all the properties will be pinned, uh, and where the wetlands actually begin. So coming off of that buffer by 25 feet, we're looking at uh, any of the buffer that extends into any uh, partial uh, properties will be delineated <coughs> caps that we have with our name and license number on them and they're delineated wetlands buffer. It's fairly obvious to anybody. Anybody who wants to actually put up a, uh, a fence or a stone wall or what have you, that's even better. 
uh, will be left to the individuals, but those buffers will be marked uh, on the land. And then on the plan, we will show them graphically as well with the different hatchings so that it's separated out and there's no confusion by anybody saying, I wasn't aware of that. It would be pretty obvious on the plan itself. There were also some questions about the, uh, the limits of clearing associated with Trillium Way along the Saco line. We have approximately 10 feet, 10 to 11 feet between the edge of the right of way, Trillium Way, right in this section, and the actual boundary line of the property, which in this case, coincidentally enough and very fortuitously, is also marked by a fairly substantial stone wall. So it's uh, fairly easy for anybody to know, uh, contractors in the field, in other words, to know where they can't go. Uh, so as far as the buffer is concerned, we're trying not to, it's, it's mostly, a, much of that is a field out in that area, but we're trying not to disturb any of the existing growth that's uh, right just on our side of that stone wall, uh, although from a clearing limitation, given the uh, grading that we'll be doing out there, there may be a little bit of that. I hope that addresses those questions, and those are referred to on the plans now. Uh, I'm not going to go into specific details as far as the engineering is concerned. Suffice it to say that it's not... Uh, uh, pretty much a, an issue. Uh, Jim's co the town engineer's comments are mostly labeling issues. He did have a question about uh, an overflow detail riser, which is just a, a graphic detail. There's nothing that we have to change on the plans for that, and we've taken care of that. And when we do come back for the final, actually before that time, we will have submitted that information to staff, and they will take a look at that as they have in the past. On the, uh, the reviewing engineer's comments from Morden and Curran, uh, as Jay had mentioned, the only thing of substance other than labeling that they had uh, suggested that we take a look at or explain to the board, basically, is the, um, the nitrate plumes. These are the subgrade plumes that are the result of a higher concentration of nitrates from the effluent of a septic system. Where do they go? Typically, unless you're building on sand, in which case they pretty much kind of go straight down, they tend to follow the topography of the surface a little bit, depending on the soil's conditions. This is called a hydrogeological survey, and what you'll see in your packets I also have a, uh, a little bit more of a, a handout for you in case you don't have them. This has got the plumes on there in a little bit more detail, a little bit more obvious than, uh, than you might have seen. Essentially what that means is you will see these plumes uh, that are subgrade, which is where the nit nitrates are essentially a, a uh, natural fertilizer, basically. And uh, that's absolutely fine when it's in the soils. What you typically want to do is keep it out of the lakes, streams, rivers, et cetera, because they tend to promote algal blooms. <coughs> so they're fairly important to know. And it's very good that Scarborough and many other communities do require these when you're looking at subdivisions with septics. In this case, what that means is those individual plumes that you see on there, which are the gray shaded areas, that is the concentration, the um, anticipated concentration of nitrates uh, as a result of the septic system that will dissipate to less than is required by minimum at the outer parameters of what those plumes look like. There are two plumes, one in particular down at the end, lots one and two, uh, where the, uh, the plumes tend to meet, albeit slightly. Uh, that's not an issue. Typically what that means is that there may be a very small, higher concentration of nitrates in that particular area where the two plumes from two different septic systems on two different properties may end up meeting briefly. Uh, that higher concentration is not an issue, however, because uh, I spoke actually yesterday, I, well, I know this anyway, but I spoke with um, John Seavey at Seavey and Mahar, uh, who we had do this, and uh, he explained as well that the plumes that they are, the extent of the plumes that you actually see on these plans are the extent of them uh, that they anticipate, given the information that we have given them from a soils perspective, and the, uh, the concentration of the minor concentration of the nitrates on one and two actually those plumes take that into consideration. So there's no issue as far as any of the nitrates, uh, nitrate plumes extending beyond our property. Beyond that, uh, I don't want to uh, monopolize the time, so if you've got any questions or particular comments, what we would like to get from the board this evening is preliminary approval, uh, and I'd be happy to address anything that you've got. All right, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Susan? A couple of quick questions. With I wouldn't have had these questions if you hadn't sent this over That's to all me. That's all right. In lot 11, it says that the existing disposal field requires abandonment, and the same thing with lot 10. Where are the, where is the well for lot 11, and where will be the well for lot 10? The well for lot 10, which is this one down here, the well for lot 10, the existing one, mm -hmm. um, is actually right in the middle of the road. <laughs> we 
have to abandon them because of the wetland impacts that we have here in Fernie Radio Road. Okay. Uh, so there'll be a new well there. I misread it. Okay. And then a lot 11 requires a new disposal field. That's right, because the disposal field that, uh, keep in mind this whole section of property down one. here was one. Disposal field for uh, the existing house is actually now on a separate lot, so okay. it doesn't necessarily have to be abandoned. But we can get a new one. And the well, will, the new well will go in. What I see is the blue <coughs> section of the lot 11. Uh, right, on I'm, lot sure what you're at. I'm looking at. Oh, no, those are the areas in which, uh, yes, as far as the wells are concerned, those are the areas that are within or outside of 100 feet. That's the 100 foot separation of the So when I look at lot eight which is the one that extends up further, no, other side, way up there, yeah. It's clear to me where the, um, <coughs> where the disposal field will go. Well, the, blue th the blue at the end where the, the driveway comes out does not necessarily mean that's where the well is going to go. That's correct. Okay. These plans just show where they could where go. They could go. Any of the, uh, the test pits that we might show preliminarily on any given plan show that a property can pass. It doesn't so necessarily Well, essentially we don't have the wells yet. laid out yet. Um, they are on the plans, but they are there only in uh, hypothetical. We show where they can go, not necessarily where they so will go. So when we go. do each lot, we'll find the well. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, if I might just jump in real quick, the, the intent of these plans is really to show that it is feasible Possible. to locate these items, but mm -hmm. as each lot sells and individual property owners go to develop their lots, they may locate septic systems in different locations and then they'll deal with sort of their well placement accordingly through the code office review process and the building permit process. Um, so should, That's should all be I have. Noted. Those are my only questions. I think that the questions that we had at our last meeting have been addressed. And turn it over. Great. Great. <coughs> Thank you, Susan. Mr. McGee. <coughs> uh, last time we mentioned the cemetery and uh, and it was kind of the loose affiliation of the word cemetery. I guess there were two gravestones that were found there. Have you explored the area further? Is it still just the two stones? Is there more to it than that? Nope, there's not more to it. We did take a look at it. Whenever we see a cemetery, and as you're probably aware, it's very challenging to move a cemetery, not that anybody would want to. So we want to make sure that uh, we take a very close look at whatever those parameters are so that we can encapsulate that, uh, figuratively speaking, so we don't go near there. And we did take a look at that, and as many of the family cemeteries that were out or that are out and about everywhere, um, we only found what we've shown on the plan. And the the easement uh, that you have provided is a 10 foot easement to get to the cemetery. Yes. It's just going to be a footpath, uh, I imagine. And would it be maintained by the owner of property number nine? It's not really even a footpath per se. It's more of a path that is allowed within the, a grass path essentially that's uh, um, allowed to go there. The interest is anybody, anyone from the public on a publicly accepted road, which eventually this would be, has the right to go there. It's not likely that too many people would, but they can. The point being is that we don't want to make something that's too um, inviting to bring a whole lot of people into a cemetery when there's nothing there. So toward that end, yes, there is an easement, but it's, we didn't intend to actually make any specific, specified path to it. Okay. That's, that's the extent of my questions at this point. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Nick. Mr. Buffard? Uh, I don't have any questions at this time. All right. Thank you. Good. Ron? Yeah, I have some. I just want to make sure I got the total picture clear in my mind. Going back to the, the last time this came before us, the net residential calculation, did that turn out to be okay? Yep, there that reviewed some, that, we were comfortable. Okay, so you're okay with that. And then, uh, just to repeat what you said and then follow it up by what Jay said, <coughs> everything is okay as far as the nitrate analysis is concerned, so even if the new owners or prospective owners were to change the location, it would still pass? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the topography of the entire area, as you can see, it, it actually goes kind of this this direction over in this section. So anything that's down in this area wouldn't matter at all. Um, the only plume that would uh, conceivably matter at all would be, um, well, let me back up here a little bit. Anytime you have nitrate plumes on an overall property, unless you require, unless you obtain an easement from somebody that's not on your property, 
um, to have something go onto their property, everything from stormwater to nitrates to the roads to the, to the, to the, ro the houses, to, et cetera, has to be on that overall subdivision. So toward that end, we have to make sure that anything is going to stay on that overall property. The one on, on uh, lot one is short enough that even if we had a somebody that wanted to go in there and build a five to six bedroom house, which is how uh, septic systems are typically designed, uh, it would, which is how these were designed, it would be, um, it would work on that particular lot. Long answer to your question, but there shouldn't be no issue there. Thank you. Um, and then I just want to uh, address Jim Wendell's comments. Have they all been addressed as far as the uh, easements are concerned uh, to include the town of Scarborough? Uh, yeah, you mean the easement to the town of Scarborough to allow access? Yes. To the, yes. And it, it says the fire tank easement. Yep. And uh, now the other only other thing I have is uh, I'm not clear either is the town of Saco. Uh, where does all that stand? There, the only thing that we need from the town of Saco, which we do already have, um, is a letter from the Department of Public Works that says that uh, very unequivocally they have absolutely no issue with our clearing in the right of way, which is actually in, in this section right down here as mm -hmm. the swamp comes into Saco. I just wanted to make sure that from a, uh, a site distance that we have the appropriate or more site distance required. that end, there are a couple of trees that are, this is on a, a slow curve right over here, and there are a couple of trees that are actually in the right of way, and uh, we can't just go cut them with impunity, so we did get to the Department of Public Works and they said, absolutely, you want to take out the trees in our right of way, go for it. And you should have, the town has the letter, I think you may have it. Okay. Okay, and... Uh, Street acceptance, that, that was some discussion last time, too. How, where does that stand? Well, we can't ask the town to be able to accept the street until it meets all the criteria as far as final coding is concerned. And when that comes, then we will, I mean, the, street doesn't, or the town does not want to accept a street that needs any work on it. Um, they, so you put them on notice of what the intent is, I guess, is where I'm going with that. That's not that it's been done, signed, sealed, and delivered, but they're aware of everything that's about to take place. Typically, and it actually works a little bit the other way around, we, or at least the way we approach things, is we approach projects such that any street, unless we specify otherwise, will eventually be a public street. In some cases, developers or our clients don't want that. In some cases, towns say you're not, whether it's Scarborough or anybody else, okay, you say it's going to be a public street, but we've got a series of criteria that we have to go through to accept it, and if you haven't met that criteria, we're not going to. So the town is aware that we are asking for public acceptance to the road, but it won't be until everything is done. And then the obvious, you said that the DEP permit is on way. It, you know it, that I'm surprised we didn't have it already, but okay. um, it, it's, we will definitely, we will not be back before you until we have that in hand and you do as, as well. I'm done. All right, thanks, Ron. I really only have one question. You've addressed all the other ones, Mr. Fisher. Um, this evening you brought up something new to me, though, and I just want to talk about it for a second. You mentioned that you're going to be putting in a culvert in the um, the retention pond up near Lots 1, across the street from Lots, lots 1. Beneath the road. Beneath yes. the road, yeah. Yes. So my question relates to is there, is it the intent that there will be a homeowners association or something established in the neighborhood? And yes. where I'm heading with that is ultimately uh, the maintenance plan mm -hmm. for the retention pond and to just make sure that the right verbiage is in um, to the contracts, if you will, when the lots are sold, that the maintenance has to occur on the, on the retention pond. Yeah, and it's not just the retention plan, pond. Thank you for bringing that up. There are a few items that are typical uh, that are under the auspices of an association. It's their responsibility. Even when the road is publicly accepted, there are still certain things pursuant to um, suggestions or comments or requirements by the board that the town doesn't want to have to deal with. Uh, so the association will have to. The overflow devices, for instance, the pond itself, making sure that over the course of years the pond doesn't set it or silt up to the point where it's no longer effective. Those are the types of things that will go into the agreement, and those agreements typically are literally attached to the deeds uh, so that when somebody buys the property either initially or three or four homeowners right. down the road, they get that same issue. 
if for whatever reason somebody doesn't get that because it was dropped from somebody's previous deed 20 years from now, there's still not an excuse to be able to say, well, I didn't know. That's the ignorance of the law is no excuse type of thing because it will have been approved by the board. The, town, the staff will take a look at that and will typically go through that agreement and make sure that from the town's perspective, everything is covered that way. Right. No, it's just something that we never see. I just wanted to, we as a board do not see it. That's so staff uh, will see it. Right. Staff will see it. I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at that and getting that in place Absolutely. as we're moving forward. So, very good. Yeah, Susan. Um, just a question, of mostly of curiosity. Um, on the April fourth letter, it's talking about. Um, wait a minute, I gotta find it. The shed is gonna be removed from lot ten, and we yes. gotta replace the. Um, mm -hmm. Is there gonna be some place where this is all noted? I mean, it's gonna be part of the subdivision, that lot, which was which now has a house on it yes. and a shed on it. Yes. It's gonna be part of the subdivision. Correct. So I would assume that it's the contractors or the developers' responsibility to make sure that that is done in a timely fashion as well. In other yes. words, the houses aren't going to all be built out and the shed not still moved and it'll all just be built into the... It will be built into the equation and uh, from what I understand of the developers that that's the first lot and uh, that house is ready to be sold essentially. Okay. So that's okay. probably going to be the first one out. I'm also and I believe those notes are, late, are, you can find them on the plan set, you do have to look they are there. Okay, thank you. Yes, they are small. But they're there. All right. I think Good. everybody seemed to be okay. Uh, and as I said, this has been fairly well vetted. So uh, I would like to make a motion that we grant preliminary approval to Trillium Place, warmly known as Woods Edge Sub Subdivision, Woods. Edge L Scabro LLC, Whew, man, I'm having a tough time tonight. Request preliminary subdivision review for an 11 single family lots off Ash Swamp Road. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? I show that to be unanimous. Thank you for your time. See you when you get your permit. Yes, indeed. Our next item this evening, Anthony Vale Way Subdivision, Norman Berube Builders request a subdivision review for three single family lots off Sarah Liberty Lane. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Board members may recall this application was before you at your last meeting. Um, at that time, staff and the board uh, had uh, this is quite a discussion with the uh, applicant regarding concerns of potential impacts of the development on the existing um, stormwater issues in the neighborhood, particularly given the, uh, the existing groundwater table in the area. Um, there's also some discussion about the road design and the waivers that would be required um, should, that, should the board be comfortable with the, um, with the proposal. Um, at this time, um, uh, you will have also received, in addition to staff's comments, a review comments from Woodard and Kern, our town engineer. Um, we asked them to take a very careful look at the issues of potential impacts to the neighbors. And at this time, um, based on applicants and Woodard and Kern's review, or staff and Woodard and Kern's review, we feel as though there, there's the need for additional evidence um, to be able to assure uh, town that uh, there won't be uh, any adverse impact on the abutters. Um, we recognize that there are existing problems in the area. It's not this developer's responsibility to fix the existing problems, but we really feel it's uh, incumbent upon the town to ensure that we're uh, doing our full due diligence to ensure that there aren't um, greater uh, enhancements to the existing issues. Um, uh, some other comments that we flagged, um, there does seem to be a bit of a little bit of discrepancy between uh, whether the intent is to really maintain this as a private road, in which case uh, the public works director has uh, um, stated he'd be comfortable uh, if the board were so inclined uh, with the waiver request to have the hammerhead on the left side of the road rather than uh, what's expected on the right-hand side, um, which is typically expected. Um, and if, if the board's so inclined, we'd like the notes on the plan to very clearly state that the, 
the rationale for the waiver is that it's the intent of this road to remain private and not to become a public road. And there seems to be a bit, little bit of discrepancy there. Um, staff also uh, had previously raised there's on the plans and actually on the plan before us, the shaded areas are identified as sort of a a, uh, a, a no disturbed buffer area for stormwater retainment. Um, they are actually initially to be disturbed, but once they're disturbed, they'll be revegetated and undisturbed. And we just feel that given you know the, the lot sizes, um, yet there'd be a revegetation plan and some type of clear demarcation on the face of the earth of this area not to be uh, disturbed in the future, because one could fairly easily see mowing occurring in this area um, if it weren't clearly marked. Um, and then finally, um, there was an issue that was raised in a previous round of, staff, uh, of public comment that uh, related to the potential uh, uh, deed restrictions on this property from a previous uh, uh, plan uh, or covenant, I should say, um, retaining uh, regarding um, that it actually occurs in the documentation that was presented um, in the property transfer between Lisa Hall to the Grandins, and we are unclear at this time what those covenants are because we weren't able to find the plans that are referenced, and so we just think that uh, further analysis of that should be uh, provided before uh, moving forward. Um, as stated, uh, in addition to staff's comments, you will have received comments from Woodard and Curran. Um, should also note, I believe you should have in front of you an uh, email uh, received from Josh Sulman, I believe, on April 17th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he had previously addressed the board and uh, continues to have some issue, uh, concerns that he wanted to bring to the board's attention. Uh, with that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks a lot. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Bill Thompson with BH2M Engineers here for Norman Baruby Builders. Uh, we were last here, <coughs> excuse me, in February, and we heard testimony from the neighbors uh, on the issues that, that they're dealing with uh, surrounding this property. And we took those uh, very seriously. And, and our charge, as Jay said, is to not impact um, off or downgrading our off-site uh, properties. Um, we were charged, I guess, with, with the planning board's uh, final comments, two things that, that, um, that I had noted. One is the nitrate study to show that the three lots as a conservation subdivision, smaller lots, can support a subsurface disposal system and a drilled well, individual wells. And our plan shows uh, the study done by C.V. Mahar, who is a class applicant, uh, when it's great length explaining the, the uh, study and the, and the nitrate plumes. But our plan and the, uh, the results show that these lots will easily support, and the locations are shown as just a suggested uh, location for a septic, and none of the nitrates leave the property, thus there's no impact to down gradient properties. The other issue was um, looking at the plans at the last submission. Um, they asked us to get some more detail uh, on a topographic survey, the grading, just to see you know, where the stormwater uh, is in a pre-condition, pre-development, and then where is it on the post-development. In order to um, reduce the post-development uh, rate of runoff for any project, with the increased impervious roadways, houses, drivers, et cetera, we need to redirect, which we've done, uh, the drainage areas to show that the stormwater leaving uh, the points at the analysis points uh, is less than the pre-development. So what we did is on sheet two, um, we went out and, and, and generated uh, a lot more uh, topographic information on the flooding properties out into the wetlands <clears throat> and I've looked at the uh, approval plan that was done here for, uh, I believe it was Woodfield Estates. Basically, this area is flat. I mean, our elevations are 139 to 141. Uh, out here in the back of these lots, or the back of our property, same elevations, 142, 143. So this whole area, including you know what was developed out into the homes, are, I mean, the, the land is very consistent, very similar. Um, so this, the Again, the, the grades out here, there's not a lot of movement in any direction. So what we've done with that information is we have two plans, again, part of your set, I believe, sheet five and six. Here is a representative layout of what the pre-development uh, stormwater surface water is doing. Here's the cupola lot here. 
and the abutters off to the, uh, to the west uh, along our common boundary line. These heavy black lines show drainage areas <coughs> and what surface water is going, and this route here shows what the uh, flow path would be on any given storm event. This area here is another uh, area of, of uh, storm water which discharges at this point. This area here being, being the largest, as you can see, is heading to the, the northwest and the impact uh, on the abutters as we sh show in this plan here. There is a small area pre-development that comes across Coppola's property and again on this corner here. So you take those numbers, the drainage numbers, and we get uh, a flow rate, so many cubic feet per second it's in our report. They're very small. In order to decrease <coughs> where the perceived area of concern on all these abutters, we need to direct, redirect that surface water, and that is accomplished with our road design and lot design. So then that final sheet is the post-development plan with our proposed roadway and the three lots graded out, basically changes that, that drainage area that you saw in total here is reduced down to this strip. So our rate of runoff in this direction is, is equal or reduced. Same with the area heading over to the Coppola property. These areas are reduced. And you can see the largest area now, including the roadway, all of that surface water by design with our road pitched off to the south, is going to discharge out at the end of the road. The lots we have all graded, so they come back toward the street. There's a small area behind the lots here and here, which that surface water will uh, continue to go, go off the lots, but it's greatly reduced um, in our analysis. The one area, again, by design, we still have surface water leaving here after development, is to pull that stormwater back in this direction. The area of discharge here does increase. It increases by about one and a half CFS, um, and again, comes across into this wetland, and from the point of the end of the road to the, to the property line, it's about 700 feet. There is an increase, again, 1.69 CFS from a 1.14 to start with, but that's by design. You pull it away, we've reduced the impact in the surface water going to any of the properties. The thing we've got to remember is with these three lots being developed, the roadway, houses, driveway, we've got about 0.6 acres of impervious, about 27,000 square feet in total over a 22.7 acre lot. That's about 2.7% of the site. A very small area. We're pulling a majority of it back here. We've reduced the impact coming off to the northwest reduce the area coming over to Coppola. But that's what we're charged with with any project, is to reduce the rate of runoff from pre to post. So the post is, again, less, less, of, a, less of a number. Jim Wendell, Peter Tubbs uh, had reviewed this and didn't have any issues. Now, uh, Wooded and Curran, I got a memo um, generated by them. I got that last week. Um, they have some questions very similar to what I just uh, explained is what is the impact on the abutting properties. Um, again, we believe that our, our report takes the pre and post, brings those numbers down, and with the grading plan shown on, on sheet two and three, um, again, we believe we've accomplished what we were charged with. So with that, uh, Jay, again, highlighted on a couple things um, on the road, the T-turnaround, um, th those any, any uh, discrepancies in the in the road being being uh, designed to to meet the town standards, I've, we can do that. I felt tonight it was important to see where we're going with the stormwater issues and resolve that with the board, and then we could come back and and have the other details addressed. So that's where we stand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I turn this over to the board. Um, <clears throat> we would like to offer an opportunity for the public to comment on this. Um, ultimately, if you would like to make a comment on what you have heard from uh, our applicant this evening, please feel free to approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. We ask that you try to keep your comments to five minutes or less, and if you are a subsequent speaker, we ask that you try to only bring us new information if possible. 
So if anybody would like to make a public comment on this, we welcome that now. For all said, I will in fact turn it over to the board. Nick, would you like to start? Well, let me say I appreciate the extra efforts you've put into uh, making sure that the water is not running off any more than it is into the abutting properties. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on questions here for a couple minutes. I might come back to it, but at right. least at least I appreciate the extra efforts that I'm seeing here uh, versus maybe our, our overall concerns from the first time you came to us. Right, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, I also appreciate your efforts to uh, clarify this and and show improvements, uh, make more assurances that this will work. However, at this point, I'm not really on board with this project. Um, when Sarah Liberty Lane was developed, uh, <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> anybody, but the Grandins built their house there at the end of the road, and their house lot was 40 acres. And my understanding that the reason for that is because it was wetland. Most of it was wetland. Um, and now we've got a proposal for three more house lots. Um, and those houses, whether they have basements or not, are going to be built up, I'm assuming, um, which means the water on those lots is going to drain off. Uh, the road <coughs> is uh, going to shed water as well. And you may direct all that water to the south, but I think it's anybody's guess as to where it's going to go from there. Uh, you, you can get you know experts to do a lot of calculations and estimates, but there's really no guarantee in my mind, and I'm sure the developer isn't willing to guarantee that either. Uh, so I need to hear more, see more. Uh, and understand more before I can get on board with this. Thank you. All right, thank you. John? Thanks for the uh, clarification on the elevations. So if we're looking at sheet six, the open space area, I assume that's remaining untouched. But then you go back to sheet five, it's showing that that flow right now is generally going towards the property owners to the north, I guess it would be. So we've obviously minimized that a lot. Uh, question I've got, elevations on lot one and two are pretty close to the same as the road. So you're going to have to bring in material uh, for the leach field. No, the leach beds are designed based on existing ground surface, not any fill material. So we, we do the design based on existing grade, and we have 15 to 18 inches of non-hydric soils which will support then there's a build up of the septic system, but we don't we don't put in three or four feet of fill and, and build a septic system. There okay. is a certain amount just to get above the groundwater table. All right. Uh, I would certainly look forward, you know, probably vote in favor of this if those elevations in lot one and two uh, were increased, because you're pretty close to the same as the road. You're 142, 143, and the lots look like they're 143. I to get those increased and slope towards the road, that water would run off from the roof and from the property would run towards the road. Can I ask for a clarification, Mr. Chairman? Sure. The lots one and two, we have a, a, a level flat area, if you will, of 143. The existing grade there is about 140, so there's three feet of fill, and it grades back to the road. There's a drainage ditch to pick up that water. So the only water coming off the lot that we're not picking up is about, you know, a 20-foot Swath, which again is greatly reduced from the uh, the existing ground. So, three feet of fill, well-drained soil is going to pull that water back to a ditch, which 
picks up at the side of the road. Um, so these these lots are being filled, you know, an average uh, about three feet. So I'm not sure. Did you want to see them higher? So is the elevation of that ditch 140? Is that what I'm seeing? <coughs> The ditch is um, at 142 up here. And when it gets down to the front of lot two, it's at 140. Okay. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Uh, I just Thanks, want sir. to follow up with my two colleagues because I'm a little bit confused. And getting back to this private road versus public road, okay, what's the discrepancy on that? Because I know that. With one of the ex existing structures, the town did a lot of work in trying to minimize the flow of water. And even though they put culverts in and did some other improvements on the public road, there's still water accumulating. And I'm trying to figure out how the public versus the, the private. The, the road they're projecting is going to be private, right? That's what the applicant has suggested in their narrative. Um, I think, let's see, so there's two issues going on here. One has to do with sort of just the, the basic design of the road as in the, the direction that the hammerhead turns. Right. right now the hammerhead kicks off to the left. That's the towns, uh, for towns operation and maintenance purposes, we like to have it kick off to the right. So where the applicant's requesting a waiver from our design standards, the Public Works Director has indicated that he is would be satisfied with the board if the board's generally comfortable with granting a waiver. He would be comfortable with granting a waiver for the just the direction that the hammerhead turns, provided that the road be, be remained as private. The applicant's narrative suggests that, but their notes on the subdivision plan suggest they might try to have it be public. And I recognize that that can pretty easily be cleaned up moving forward, and I think I've heard the applicant already this evening sort of talk about their intent is to address those issues to have it remain private. So that, that, that's separate and distinct from the stormwater question. And at this point, based on the, the narrative or based on the um, reports that have been generated in Wooden Kern's most recent report um, analysis, really trying to get a better handle on the hydrology of the area. I think the initial assessment by, by Jim Wendell and Peter Tubbs really took a, a look at sort of um, really sort of just the, um, how, do, how best describe it, the, the quantified <coughs> calculations as far as the amount of impervious area and the flow and where it's generally being directed towards. I don't think that at that time we had a good handle based on sort of the the characteristics of the, of the site based on the abutters comments and based on other um, indications we've gotten now from public works as to the drainage, the existing drainage problems just based on not so much, it's really a, the groundwater table it has such seasonal variability. Essentially the area, the soils in the area are generally sandy, which you think is typically good for percolate, you know, for <coughs> Uh, groundwater. However, there seems to be a hard pan of clay at some depth, which prevents, you know, during, again, high seasonal variation when there's uh, a lot of rain events, no melt, what have you, um, the groundwater table simply pops out of the earth as it stands now. And so the issue that I think is addressed in Warner and Kern's memo is that there's a further analysis that Warner and Kern is suggesting is needed so that our records can clearly indicate, I think to Mr. Buffard's point, that there isn't going to be an adverse impact on the abutters. At this time, we can't, it doesn't seem that we can be assured of that statement. Um, and so um, that's... You just that's did break. very well in what I was asking. Okay, and just <laughs> following up on what Dave said and what John said, that's the conclusion I'm coming. I'm not convinced that there isn't going to be an impact the way the water is going to flow right now, and I don't, and, and following up on John, I'm not convinced that just building these on uh, with no basement really solves the problem. And so I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with my two colleagues in, in their concerns as far as the flow of the water. The, the reason why I asked about the road is because a lot of work already has been done and there still is a lot of 
water flowing. And, uh, and, and I guess the follow-up question that I would have is if, if it goes to the left or the right, that doesn't have, it won't have any impact as far as the overall problem is concerned. That's a question, not a statement. I think that's, I mean, you're going to have the same amount of impervious area. It's a really a matter of where the water flows. But I think generally, given that very small sort of head of the hammer, if you will, that's probably not going to have a great deal of impact with it. <coughs> but I think, you know, it certainly, it appears to staff anyway that this discussion merits further discussion probably between the applicant's engineer and the town's peer review engineer to really come to a uh, common agreement as to what type of analysis should be done to, so to provide this board with the evidence uh, necessary um, to ensure that we're not going to have adverse impacts on the abutters. Again, recognizing that there are existing conditions and that's not this applicant's charge is to solve the existing problems. Right. It's this applicant's charge to ensure and provide evidence that they won't have any more adverse impacts. That, and we don't, the staff's analysis, we don't believe we're there yet. Yeah, okay, and not to say we couldn't get there. We don't know. Okay, and even for the new homes, I, I, I'm not convinced that, that the problem is solved based on what we've heard. Okay. All right. Thank you. Susan? I'm generally in agreement, but I think it's mainly because I'm very confused. I'd just like to make sure I understand some very basic things. What is labeled open, uh, what I'm looking for is how this is not going to impact the existing homes anymore, in fact, might even help if that's possible, okay? So we take a look, what I would really like to see, yeah, okay, we take a look at the road, and as far as I can see, the plan for the road is that the impervious surface is going to be, by design, draining into the wetland. Correct. Okay. So there's nothing about the road itself that is going to create more of a difficulty for the present owners off Holmes Road. That's correct. Okay. Now we get to the open space lot. This here. No. The one that one, is one off Liberty Lane. Is that part of this subdivision? I mean, it is. it is part of this property. It is. But nothing's going to be done to that property. No, it will not be. So there's not going to be anything done on that piece of property that is going to affect the water tables on any of the other houses. That's correct. Left in its natural state. Okay, so we've got three lots. Lots one and two, you tell me in your post, um, page six, mm -hmm. that... The way you are going to direct the water on these new lots will be to the, towards the road. Correct. Except for a, a slight buffer. Correct. Which will mean that there is, if I can make this make sense. If that were to happen, lots one and two would therefore Take, le take land that is now flowing into the existing houses and have it flow in the opposite direction. Correct. Some of this area is, is flowing. And just one and two. No, no, just don't, no, don't, don't okay. talk about hydraulics. With okay. Me. Lots one and two. Your question again. You're going to you're going to um, mound it, or you're going Correct. to direct We're the water the towards of the, water. the road. Correct. That water now. If there's water there now. Correct. It sits there. Some moves, but it mostly sits. If, yep. si if it flows, it flows up. It flows. Uh, it, it seems like it's up because the paper is up. Right. It isn't flowing up. It's flowing into existing lots. Correct. Okay. So by changing the topography so that the water on proposed lots one and two now flow towards the culvert in the opposite direction, except for a small buffer, and I can't remember how many feet that buffer is. It might be. I'm sorry? 20, 25 feet wide. Okay, so except for 25 feet, all the rest of the property that now potentially is going to flow into the homes that abut those properties are no longer going to flow into those properties. So essentially the way it's shown, there's going to be less impact than it now exists. That's correct. So not only are you not creating more problems, I'm not right? I, I think just, uh, just to jump in, but I think what Water and Current's memo is suggesting is we don't know that for a fact yet. Okay, I'm, we, not, I'm, I'm not there. Okay. I'm not there. Okay. I'm just trying to understand what is being said by the applicant. Fair enough. Okay. I, okay. That I did. Yeah. All right. Now, lot three, at this point, I don't remember. 
What's happening to Lot 3, the way you're going to direct it? Lot, lot 3, again, will, will, be, will be coming. This, this heavy line indicates yep. the limits of stormwater going this way. This is coming back to the road also. But it won't this be going piece. towards the houses on Holmes Road. That's correct. This piece here will be going, as it does now, to, toward the Capolo lot. But the rest of it's going to go towards the road and be picked up by the in culvert. Ditch, in a ditch to the discharge here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now I get back to what I think you were going to say. I'm very proud of myself. In theory, this works for me. Because I don't see that what you're doing is creating any greater impact on what now exists. In fact, it possibly may affect it, create less of an effect. If, however, our engineers say that there's not really any engineering proof, and that's why we have town staff, hmm, and, and, and we do all the kind of multiple examinings that we do, is that I'm going to go along because I trust the system to find out whether or not the actual conditions that are out there will do what the applicant is saying. I have no problems sitting here tonight with the concept. In fact, I think it makes a lot of sense but I don't know anything about the hydraulics of it. Okay. So I'm going to turn the hydraulics of it back over to the rest of the staff to make sure that when we see you again, we get it. Okay. And this allows me to say something that has nothing to do with this app. Well, not really. It does have something to do with this applicant, but this is just a general, a general thing I notice. I drive around all the time looking at proposed and recently done and to be done developments in Scarborough. And, and we're getting to the point now, folks, where there's very little land left that isn't wet. And why would anybody buy a house that was up on a knoll with water all around it in the town of Scarborough? People don't ask questions. Somehow or another, I would like to have there be something that says to people, you know, pay attention <laughs> to the topography of the land where you're going to be buying your property. You know, it, it, it's wet. And if, if you know it's wet before you buy it, then, you know, buyer beware. And I don't see how you could possibly not know that this land is going to be wet. So I'm just saying that there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a balance here between the person who is going to want to purchase the property and the person who's developing the property. You can't make wetland anything but wetland. But I do think that we don't want to make the situation any worse than it all, anymore. We don't want to create any greater impact than we already have. And we don't want to create any new impact either. And we're going to have to, and we're getting, we're getting very, we're getting much more, not much, but we're getting, becoming more and more particular about how that comes down because there's <coughs> so little land left that isn't wet. Thank you for letting me have that podium. All right. Did I Appreciate respond to that? Thank you. I'd like to respond to that. Sure. First of all, most buyers have inspectors. And, and, and when before they buy a property. You think. Okay. Well, I'm telling you, uh, the best of my knowledge. So if, it, if between the buyer and the inspector, if they don't ask those questions, then, then that's well, I'm not blaming anybody. Problem. I'm just saying it's and, all wet. And second of all, the implication, and, I, and, and I'm on the other end of the spectrum here, is yes, I agree that there's, there's uh, a, a lot of development going on. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the more the better. Okay, and uh, because uh, again, I, I stand behind the tax situation in the town, and and therefore, if we get good projects, I don't mean just projects for the sake of projects, but good projects, then so be it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, um, Mr. Chairman, would it be all right if I jumped back in? Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think out loud, if if that's all right with everyone. Um, it's more of a question for Jay, I believe. The has has there been any precedents or any anything that you guys can remember in the past where some sort of bond has been placed aside this for improvements if this didn't work? Let's just say we have a, a proposal here to change drainage and we find out that the contractor has not done what we expected them to do. Has there been a, a performance bond set aside? as to lessen the, the impact to the abutters? Has that, something like that ever been done? Is it even allowed to be done? I, th I think you're asking two sorts of questions, so I'm going to answer it in two ways. One, to the contractor who builds mm -hmm. what is approved by this board, yes, there is a performance guarantee that they need to post before they start building a road 
and the town holds that until the road is built per spec. Mm -hmm. And then the performance guarantee is released. But that's building what was what's, what's engineered. Right. The question as to what's engineered, you know, if, if what's engineered and evidence is provided to this board and the board approves it and then it's built, performance guarantee is released, and then three years later we find out there's stormwater problems. Um, no, I mean, there's really not a lot of recourse in that instance. Um, you know, potentially a private property owner could try to go back through the chain of the, the applicant and developer and try to maybe try to find suits there. But once, that's why it's really incumbent upon this board to be sure that there's sufficient evidence for each of the criteria that are in the ordinance. Each one of the 18 or so subdivision review criteria are there to require that they submit sufficient evidence. And if this board is, doesn't feel that that's presented, then the board needs to act accordingly. If there's sufficient evidence, or regardless of, of any sort of out, you know, outside influence, provided there's sufficient evidence provided to those criteria, then the board needs to act accordingly as well. Um, so um, as far as the town going back, should a subdivision be approved because there was adequate evidence provided but the engineering was off? It's sort of a, yeah, there's, there's no precedent for a. So make sure we get it right. Is <laughs> make sure we get it right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. All right. Thanks, Nick. Um, <coughs> So to try to answer your question to the board in terms of trying to get a feel for where board members stand, I will weigh in okay. and say theoretically I agree with you that if you can do the things logic says to me, water flows downhill, therefore if, I'm, if I got a three-foot grade, I'm going to move water away from um, the existing abutters, with the exception of the Lehman family, as we're not really doing anything to that open space coming in along the opening of the road. So they have the property that is the closest to Sarah Liberty Lane. Right. So there's really, we're not really impacting them in any way, shape, or fashion. What was, for the most part, what's happening today is going to happen, uh, although I might there might be some impact by what was coming from, actually there was. You showed one flow coming in off your analysis, po analysis point number four. So almost everybody on that border looks like they would be positively impacted. All right, so I will say theoretically, I, I understand, and if that is in fact what we're dealing with, then I can support that, all right? At the end of the day, I'm going to let the engineers duke it out and tell us what's what, because I don't think any of us here on this board has the uh, ability to do the engineering analysis themselves and make, make the point. So uh, we'll rely on the engineering community to help us there. The... Um, We've talked about the hammerhead issue, um, et cetera. Did, I do not think anything was addressed on the land transfer covenant, was it? Haven't we haven't heard anything, anything on that. Do you have any I do not, information no. on that, no. Bill? Our, our understanding is the Grandin piece, the 40-acre piece, was not part of the subdivision. But I think my client's understanding is that it would not be bound to the same covenants, but, and I haven't seen the covenants. I mean, they plan on building some big homes. They're not going to build a small house. So I don't think you're going to see any difference in quality out there if that's the concern of the neighbors. The subdivision is approved under the conservation subdivision, which is zoning. We're, we're bound to that. But again, we have submitted uh, initially a conventional subdivision plan that shows that it would support three 80,000 square foot lots. The conservation <coughs> district uh, zoning requires you to to make them mm -hmm. smaller. 
and we have you know 18, almost 20 acres of open space. So um, that's that's a, that's our understanding from what the what any conditions from the previous development of uh, Sarah Liberty Lane would apply to this parcel that, that the Barubis have under contract. I mean, again, if, where do we need to go on this issue, Jay? Do we? Yeah, is this something we need to be involved with? Is this a, a legal matter? It, I, I believe it's a legal matter. Um, in reviewing the deeds, and I can, um, there's reference to a plan. Um, let me see. How do I say it? There's, there's covenants that state that this property should be governed by the general notes on a, uh, a plan, a noted plan in the, in the deed. However, that plan doesn't appear to have been recorded as best as staff can tell. So at this point, as we put in our comments, we would ask the applicant, we'd seek the applicant to provide a legal analysis um, if what they're proposing um, is, um, is appropriate given the, the uh, existing deeds and covenants on the property. As board members will recall, there was, initially there was some question because there's a complex history with this lot with regards to it providing some density to the subdivision along um, uh, Holmes Road. Um, and so there was some legal questions there, but that seems to have been answered. Um, and at this point, so there's this additional question was raised by one of the um, uh, abutters. And when staff looked into it, we do believe it, it is a question that should be addressed prior to um, approval. approval. Okay. All right, so ultimately we need to have the applicant work on that and come back to us with, with some kind of a definitive answer on that item. Um, water certainly, as we've said in the past, is the big item. So if we can get the engineering firms together um, and come up with what everybody believes to be the best answer to the question, um, is probably again where we need to take this. If there is any other consideration to private versus public road, obviously, Bill, you need to address those items. Correct. Um, the vegetation plan that was mentioned earlier. I think those are the, the, the those are the issues that we're still concerned about. Um, is there anything else you need from us this evening, Bill? No, I just uh, appreciate your, your time, and I hope we've accomplished quite a bit with, with the work you asked us to do. And, and again, somebody said, well, what is the problem out there? Well, the, I think we've solved the problem in demonstrating how our grading plan works. Uh, the first half of that road, 270 feet, is curbed, so no water will leave the road. It will continue down the curb line until yep. it gets to a ditch. So, I mean, We've done everything that hydraulics will allow, and as you said, water flows downhill, and we've got it all going down to the to the south. And when it gets into that wetland, I did review around the backside on the uh, Woodfield subdivision. Um, all of those lots uh, were built up, and their water comes back to their mm -hmm. road in a ditch system. So none of that land is, is impacting our open space. And the grades at the edge of their property are equal to what we have. So. You know, the, there's always two parts to this equation, and one is getting the engineering correct, and then the second and probably as important, if not more important part, is to actually getting the work correct. So, I mean, that's going to be one of the key factors. If, if the hydrology and everything is what it, we believe it to be, and if the grading and everything does what we hope it'll do, then it should hopefully be an improvement to the abutters, but that's all obviously totally dependent upon do we do it the way the engineering said it needed to be done. And I, this just happens to be one of those projects where the margin of error is probably reduced uh, in terms of um, potential impact. Well, would it encourage me in the fourth engineer on this? I, I think we'll uh, come up with the, the right answer. <laughs> I, feel, I feel comfortable with that. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.
Uh, before we move on to our next item this evening, I do need to make one announcement. I am remiss in doing so, but item number nine this evening, Phil Hall requests a review for a subdivision amendment to lot 11C of the Josh Hill subdivision has been tabled at the request of the applicant. So uh, apologize if um, somebody was waiting for that item this evening. Our next item, item number six, Eastern Village subdivision, Ballantyne Development LLC requests a review of their proposed six amended subdivision plan. Mr. Chase. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think some board members will recall, um, application, uh, the Eastern Village was originally approved back in 2008 mm -hmm. under the provisions of the Traditional Neighborhood Development Option Overlay District. The intent of the CND zoning is to enable flexible and creative creativity and design, and as such, the subdivision was approved with a mix of housing types and uses um, and was granted um, special space and bulk standards um, throughout the area through a, a rigorous review process with the board. As, as, uh, as the title will indicate, there have been five previous amendments. The applicant is now before the board for a sixth amendment, which really has sort of three discrete components to it. One is to add six new lots along Ballantyne Way. Um, and um, these lots were actually before the board had won the previous amendments and was with withdrawn at that time, the applicant's now proposing those. Um, so at this point, that's really only questions that in that regard is how does these lots fit in with the density? I think the applicant's done a pretty good job with their tables of trying to demonstrate to the board sort of the, the, the complex subdivision with a lot of nuance and um, staff was appreciative of the work that went into trying to walk staff and board members through that. Um, the second sort of major component is to modify the construction phasing. Um, this was originally a nine-phase subdivision. The applicant is now looking to make it eight phases. Um, pretty subtle differences there. Um, however, staff does have two primary questions. One um, has to do with the affordable housing component. I believe the applicant is prepared to talk with the board about that. Um, but at this point, uh, board members may recall the application or the original subdivision was approved with 13 um, affordable housing units, which are part of a density bonus. Um, and to date, and I know the applicant's been before the board with these type of discussions. Um, for a variety of reasons, the affordable housing components have not been able to gain traction, and, and they're proposing to amend that at this time. However, ostensibly, at the end of the project, there's still proposed to be 13 affordable housing units, but we do feel that is worthy of discussion. Um, staff also just flagged a couple of questions we have with the Eastern Trail improvements, and we do recognize that these were part of an original, part of the original approval. Um, but really, just in, in looking at it, we were curious as to why there's a stretch of the East, the off-road Eastern Trail that's proposed to be part of Phase Five, where it seems like a lot of work is happening with Phase Three. Um, and that's really just a, a question. And the other item for consideration is the terminus of the of the trail sort of seems to come right into the parking lot. We wonder if it, if, if it um, consideration might be given to wrapping it around the, I'll call it the sort of southern edge of the parking lot to tie in maybe a little easier with the trail. Um, and then the third component, maybe maybe the most complex component, is the additional uh, uh, addition of housing types throughout the subdivision. Um, the applicant's looking to add um, limited single family units cottages and duplexes. Board members may recall it wasn't too long ago that the zoning was a change to allow the TND to take advantage of the, um, uh, the flexible residential density factors that exist in our zoning and have been incorporated into many of our more modern zones that came along sort of after the TND was established um, and that part of the zoning was adopted and so now the applicants before you to take advantage of those and to talk about um, the new housing types. In that regard, really, staff just had questions with regards to how those new housing types and uh, the additional density, uh, what impacts it may have on storm water and any DEP permitting. Uh, particularly interest is parking, um, particularly for the cottage lots, which are um, you know, 
some of the lots are 800 square feet, uh, and so just want to be sure that adequate provisions are, are being uh, noted for parking. Um, and then I guess the other item that, that staff noticed is that the, with the adjustment and the new housing types, there's, there seems to be some adjustments to the uh, road designs and some open spaces um, in, in future phases of the plan. Um, and to date, we haven't received a full detail sheet um, for the overall subdivision build out, um, sort of highlighting those areas and working through those particulars. And so we thought that um, that should be considered a component um, of this application moving forward. Um, with that, uh, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. I will note that the applicant um, did provide response to staff comments on Friday. Uh, staff had a chance to take a cursory look at some of the responses this afternoon, um, and I know the applicant's prepared to share those with the board at this time, but given the board's policy not to receive comments um, at that later date, we had not forwarded that along to you to date. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Joe Laveria from Face Poppet and Thorndike is our company name. Last time I was before you, we were DeLuca Hoffman, but we are no longer DeLuca Hoffman. So. But the same company, same folks, same place. Um, been involved with Eastern Village since the beginning, so certainly, as I think Jay gave you a pretty good summary of, of what we're seeking tonight, and it is um, pretty uh, involved a complicated process or project in terms of uh, from beginning to end of what we've done in terms of development type, uh, residential type of units. As Jay said, I won't, I'll be more interested in trying to answer some of your questions as best as opposed to recap on what Jay asked but, or I outlined for us. But basically, in summary, um, the, the three items he did talk about, um, I think, did kind of capture it. That the six lots that we were adding along Ballantyne Way was in front of the board, you may recall, um, the last time we were here as part of the phase two uh, changes. We retracted that. It had to do more with sewer. That's an area of Ballantyne Way that does, currently does not have sewer in it. We were proposing to do the sewer via a private system, which the Santa District was unwilling to um, allow to occur at that time, which is one of the reasons why we retracted it. Those lots, though, that same application was submitted to the DEP at that time, and we got approval for everything that was proposed at that time. So those lots actually have received DEP approval, um, but they, not, they did not get local approval. They ended up being retracted out of the local approval application. Um, so those we're looking to add back, and we are going to be putting sewer now essentially in Valentine Way. So unfortunately, we'll be disturbing a section of road that we just built not too long ago in order to get sewer in to support those lots. The change in phasing is Pretty subtle if you looked at the comparison in the application materials that we submitted in terms of what's changing for phase three. Phase three um, has uh, always previously included the work along Old Eastern Road, the pond, and the, and the entrance in from Old Eastern Road. It's really the, the connection between that side of the project, say, and the current phase two, 2A, two 2B two combination. It's, it's changing which road it connects onto in a few of the lots. Um, but I think in, to in total, I think some of the important things associated with phase three were the Eastern Road improvements onto Ballantyne Way or onto Black Point Road, the large stormwater pond, and really creating that connection through the development so we now have vehicular access um, on two sides of the project. And then with that, utilities, water system loops through as well. So that was one of the other things I think we've always been committing to doing by phase three. So I think those will happen. The Residential types, um, which is kind of probably the most complicated thing, is um, hopefully was explained well enough. Uh, I know there was a comment on Jay's about the duplex units that I tried to, I responded to, which I know now you folks did not get the response to, but there was a little bit of a misunderstanding about the duplex units because we're looking to add, the original project had single family house lots, um, townhouse lots, and essentially multifamily or apartment units were kind of the three types of residential uh, uses we had. And we're looking to introduce what we're calling limited single family, which is a, a smaller unit. It's only 1,200 square feet of living space. 
so it's kind of tied to those residential density factors, so that would count as a .66 residential unit as opposed to a whole unit. Um, the carriage house lot is the very small lot, um, and again, that one's tied to uh, a living space of no more than 750 square feet, I believe, which again counts as a .5 residential unit as opposed to one for a total single family unit. We also were proposing to do a duplex unit, which again, most people understand duplex is the building, two units in it, um, which is what we're looking at doing here, but it's really split between two lots. So there is one half of the duplex unit on one lot and one half of the duplex unit on the other lot. I think that um, was a misunderstanding at one point, I think in Jay's, at least when he commented, because he was thinking we were looking at a duplex unit on each lot, and that's not really how we're looking at doing it. So the, the, the tabulation that we had given in the application was, in my mind, is, is correct um, in terms of how many units we would have and, and that total residential unit count if you look at the, the table one, two, and three, those numbers I think are correct. Um, Jay, did, we did get some comments. I'd be happy, to, since you didn't get them, I'd be happy to run through those if you'd like. Um, if not, I, I won't, but one of those was the duplex units on stormwater, which was another question that he asked. Um, again, if we hadn't gotten DP approval for the six lots along Ballantyne Way previously, we would, that's something we would have to address because it, it's an expansion of the previous footprint of Eastern Village, but that has been approved by DP, so I'll put a check in the box on that one. That one's okay. The other changes on <coughs> the lots that we're doing that are taking into account the limited residential, or the limited single family, the carriage house, those changes in lots for those different types. They're not changing the overall development footprint of Eastern Village, it's really just a reshaping of the lots and the way the project was originally approved by DP, there's a, there's a percent impervious coverage that's essentially to the entire residential area outside of roads, sidewalks, whatever, so just the lots themselves. So we're not changing the developable area and we're not changing the total impervious area that's associated with them as part of the approval. So the stormwater numbers that DP has approved are in fact still valid for the project. With respect to parking, uh, Kerry Anderson from Ballantyne Development can kind of go through a little bit more with you on the, the, what the carriage house is, what it would look like, but essentially the carriage house is living space essentially over garage space in theory, and they're, they're very nice, but I'm just saying in terms of that, so it's the two parking spaces that are being provided are essentially the bottom floor of the unit itself, and the living is, is above. And on the limited residential, um, or the limited single family, I'm sorry, I keep going, residential. limited single family is the same thing. There will be a garage unit and one off-street parking space that's provided on each one of the lots. So each lot will have two off-street parking spaces provided on the lots themselves. I think that was one of the questions that, that Jay had. Um, with respect to the Eastern Trail, again, I, I'm not so sure that we're opposed to how it connects onto Old Eastern Road. I mean, where, where it's shown now, to be honest with you, it does come out into that parking space. I mean, I'll also say that was 2007 or 2008. I, I know we had a number of meetings about that trail and how it was going to go along the side of the road. and. Um, you know, where it actually connects, or I'm sure we could adjust that somewhat. It probably doesn't have to come out at that same, at that location that it's shown. Um, all I would say is that at that time, everybody was happy with where it was, but again, it's nothing that's been built yet, so I mean, where the end of that is, it's, it's probably not the end of the world and that it can be moved and, or adjusted accordingly. I think it's, it's always been in phase five. Um, I mean, we would like to keep it there, but I understand the staff's um, questions. We are doing a lot of work in that area, so I do understand that. Um, I think we could certainly um, make a connection or a reconnection back to Old Eastern Road, and it's where we're terminating it now, but I mean, I guess we can certainly open up a discussion on that. Again, our request would be to keep it the way it is. It's in Phase 5, and that's kind of where we would like to keep it for now. So I will try to answer any of your questions as best I can. I, I'm, I know the tables, there's a lot of information on those tables. I wasn't going to try to go down through it unless you'd like me to. Um, but we tried to give a comparison of what the pre
previous approval was and what we're seeking as part of this amendment. Was that? Yep. All right. Uh, this also is another item that we have on our agenda this evening, which has uh, w or which is open to public comment. Does anybody here who would like to make public comment on this item this, tonight? We welcome you to do so. Please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record, please. Okay, not seeing any, I will turn it over to the board. Dave? Thank you. <coughs> uh, I have no problem with the changes uh, you proposed. Um, my only question is for staff. Are there plans to put a light at the end of Eastern Road? The end of, at the intersection of Black Point, I presume. No, there are no plans no. for that. No. There's no no need this time, or is that or is it a possibility down the road? Through through their traffic movement permit that was received with the original approval, there wasn't found a need for a light. Um, there was found a need for pedestrian improvements given the Eastern Trail work and that, that work has been modified from what was originally approved by the applicant by the town because um, the town was prepared to move forward and, and so in coordination with the applicant, um, the town has made those improvements or made actually slightly adjusted improvements from what the applicant had originally approved um, and so those, um, like I said, that was in coordination with the applicant. Um, those have been accomplished uh, to the extent that they're planned to be. I'm all set. All right, thanks, Dave. John? I'll wait. Ron? Yep. Uh, it's getting late, so numbers, you can run numbers by me, and they all sort of just blend together. So I'm going to ask Jay, are we all set with the, the, uh, the density, the duplex, and everything now? Uh, yes, as I, as I mentioned, the applicant did provide a response to staff comments, and I did get a chance to take a cursory look at that. It does appear that um, um, they've assuaged my concerns with regards to overall density on the site, and I do have a better understanding of the duplex. Um, it may be some additional minor notation if it um, be clear. Yeah. Okay. Um. I heard what you said about the EP and stormwater. I can deal with that. I heard what you said about the garaging, but according to what I understand, the fire department has expressed concerns about the way things are right now, and I just want to make sure things aren't going to get worse with the a new construction, because that they say that their mobility through this site as it now exists is a problem. I mean, what I, all I can say right now is that the road, I mean, again, the project is, it's 20 foot wide roads. So it is narrow streets out through there. Um, we are required to provide two, two parking spaces off site for each one of the units. Um, as you know, most of this project is, or a good portion of it is, uh, garages around the backs and the alleyway areas. Um, the very beginning of the project, the first phase of the project, um, Driveways. We're not, it's not that way, so there were driveways off of uh, uh, the road itself. So I'm sure during the construction of those houses, there's been a number of folks that, contractors, whatever, that had been parking on the street. Perhaps that's what the fire department's issues have been. Uh, that's the first, I guess, I've heard of the concern when it was raised. But I mean, like I said, as it's as it's by the the TND, it was it is by design a narrow street system. It's 20 foot wide roads and that's what the standard was. So I mean that's what's being developed as part of the project. I'm going to combine my next two comments into one and that's the Eastern Trail mm -hmm. and the affordable housing. Okay. Okay. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think the board has bent backwards to accommodate the applicant uh, and putting things off uh, and giving the amendments to the original situation. And I think now I'd like to see a little bending in the other way uh, in uh, seeing that when work is being done down at that end that perhaps uh, the Eastern Trail could be 
diverted a little bit as as noted by staff comments and um and at least one unit of affordable housing uh be begun uh I mean, because we keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off um and I'm beginning to get a little concerned that um it's never going to happen and I understand because I sat through the complexity of the affordable housing uh the way it's written in 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 in, in Scarborough and and how it's being marketed I, I appreciate that but I'd still like to see some effort done in in a unit of affordable housing uh, begin I'm done. all right thank you Susan I agree with Ron in that um it'll get done affordable housing but we haven't heard anything about it in a long time and there are a lot of changes being requested here, including different kinds of um, building types. So I don't expect it to be tonight, but and maybe it was in the thing we didn't get, but I would like to have some idea of what the long range goal is for how to fit this in. We know that that didn't work there and this didn't work here, but we're talking about new ways to bring in buildings and we're talking about um, you know, new densities and so on. So at some point during this phase, during this um, amendment, I'd like to have something offered to us as a, over how it's going to fit into the overall plan. Um, just a question, when it says on the first page of your April 2nd letter that the applicant is seeking to amend it to include the following, one is the creation of six new lots, and number three is the new types. Question was, are we talking about any of those particular new types being shown in the six new lots? Or is it just three separate things completely? Uh, well, it's three separate things, com I guess, completely. And when I reread my letter, I always read things before you come in. <laughs> and I guess I would say is, at the time when, when I wrote this, the creation of six new lots are along Ballantyne Way. That is true but there are actually more lots being created when you read through the rest of it. When we started to go into the new types, because we actually sat down with Dan uh -huh. um, a few weeks ago to actually go through this, and when we were talking about what we, what we essentially did was took, in some instances, say two or three existing lots that were in part of the plan and modified them to incorporate say a carriage house into them or to break them up into the limited single family. So it was discussed where that might actually happen. Yes. Yeah. But and it's not in this particular phase. Nope. Uh, there is some of it in this particular phase. Oh. There are two there are two duplex um, there are two duplex buildings that would go in. Um, if you Again, on the subdivision plat, I kind of highlighted the lots that we've actually done some editing to in some dimensional format or, or some type. Again, as you come in on Ballantyne Way, these are the these are two lots, two of the six. Mm -hmm. um, those would be duplex units. So again, the, on there's a kind of a, a topology that's on there that's that's got the lot type designation, so the DP is a duplex unit, so there's a duplex unit on this lot and a duplex unit, well, it's one duplex building, but split between those so two lots. So one and three are connected? They are. They, they only be, never mind, I yes. interrupted. They are, that's what, what I'm saying, when I read through that again, I cut. well, I could see how somebody would not understand what I was trying to say. We, we built six lots, essentially, along Ballantyne Way, but the duplex units, there's, there's two duplex buildings going in on those on that entry as well. When you get into the rest of the development, this was a cluster right up in here, which is lots around 103 to 105, mm -hmm. where we reconfigured those original three lots and included, you'll see with this, like say a 104 and a 104A and a 105 and a 105A. That's where they, they were broken up into one single family lot, say for instance, that may have been divided into two limited single families. So there's those uses, there are some of the new uses proposed in phase three. It's 
tangentially. Mm -hmm. They are connected. Okay. I'm sure I'm, I may be the only one who doesn't quite understand this, but you have two attached on the duplex. Yes. Two attached housing units located on two separate lots and under separate ownership. Mm -hmm. But it's called a unit? Well, it's kind of like the townhouses. I guess I would say if you think about what we did on the townhouses, the townhouses, again, were one building. Per. One building yeah. that, that had at least three units in it. They okay. could have up to six but they had to have at least three. So it's basically a mini version of the townhouse in a way. If they were on each, I really was, I haven't been yep. around for a while. Yep. Okay. okay. So they were on, each one of those townhouses has its own lot? Yes. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Okay. So that makes sense when you start talking about the single. Okay. Um, I would like to, again, because I've been, I only live down the street, but I've been away from this. <laughs> According to the amended phasing plan that you that you suggest you know that you're presenting tonight mm -hmm. for um mm -hmm, dated April two thousand and fourteen it's got it's got activity for phase three on the eastern trail okay yeah, coming One in phase three is what we call open space, but that must be with the pretension pond. Correct. That's why it's in part of page phase three, because we need the retention pond? Correct. But we're not going to finish this all off and make it nice open space right now. We're just going to build the retention pond. Well, I mean, it'll be finished off in terms of that it'll be grass growing and everything that we need to do for the pond. It's, it's the leg of the eastern trail that, um, so as, the, as the, the portion of the eastern trail that comes in from Black Point Road right. that runs along Old Eastern Road, to our entrance. Now I understand that all the information, all the stuff on, on Black Point Road has been completed, but from Black Point Road down to where it says, you know. Well, down to where it enters into the right. project, that will be built as part of phase three. It's really from there, the rest of the way across the bottom, essentially that, that's, that southerly end of the site. Is where did I get the idea of phase five? Um, well, there's notation of it on the phasing plan oh, that, okay. that it's to be done in phase five, and I think, again, in Jay's um, memo that was discussed as being that okay. that's where it's proposed in phase five. All right. I um, have no problems at all with the new um, types of residential housing being part of the Long Range Planning Committee. This is exactly what we envisioned, and I think it's perfect for uh, this location. I mm -hmm. really like it a lot. Uh, the construction facing plan, I trust that that is just something that staff and you people can work out as whatever. And the six new lots, I don't have any problem with that either. My only issue really has was <coughs> wanting to understand more clearly about the work on um, Eastern Road and to ask that we take into account right at this point, if at all possible, an overall view of what to do about affordable housing. Yep, and again, I know Kerry can certainly speak a little bit more to you folks about what he has done or what their past efforts have been. And we've done that before, but I know that that was one of the things that Jay did ask for us for us to be prepared I'm to. I'm more concerned about the future than the past. Nope, I know, but just in terms of what the thought is and what the efforts have been and what they're looking to do moving forward. Yep. Okay, thank you. Nick? Nothing at this time. John? Right. I have no problem with the uh, six additional lots. I don't have any problem with the expanded types of residential units. I'll express the same concern that Ron had. Uh, this board and the town council has done a lot uh, to push this through and all kinds of amendments. I don't want to see the affordable housing thing kicked down the road anymore. I think we need to make an effort to at least do one of the units in this phase and not push it off. And uh, as far as the Eastern Trail, uh, I also think that extra thousand foot of that's supposed to push off from phase five should be done in right now. Along with the phase three, 700 feet. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Um, I guess I'd like to start with just a general comment. And because of my line of work, I look at plans a lot. Um, 
one of the things that would be helpful when you're trying to make us understand some of the changes that you're bringing forward to us is to try to help pick out the areas that you're physically going to be make the changes on or in on the plans themselves. I mean, like, you've got them very nicely highlighted in red now. That's a beautiful thing. You can clearly ID what you're looking for, but when you're going down through this package and looking at a plan like this, it is extremely difficult to figure out which lot we're supposed to be dealing with. And if there was some way that you could either, you know, hatch or do something um, to help us see the changes, that would be appreciated. Um, I'm in agreement with my board member, my board fellow board members on the Eastern Trail Road. Um, the affordable housing issue. The thing that's concerning me is I don't want to get to the end of the project and find out that um, we couldn't do the affordable housing. Therefore, we're going to eliminate the extra, uh, the bonus that we got because we had affordable housing and we just turn around and eliminate four properties or five properties at the end and not really get the affordable housing in. So that I've seen that happen in the past. Developers will come to us and indicate that they couldn't make that happen. And I understand that. That's a, that is, in fact, a problem. Um, but my concern is that we continue to approve these bonuses and we're not seeing, seeming to get any affordable housing come into the town. And if that's, if that's a process of the fact that we can't bring people into the town, I get that. Let's not try to fool ourselves into thinking we're going to. Um, so I also would like to see uh, us try to move on that before we get too much deeper into the program. At least get one. Um, can I just, I'm sorry, I don't Sure, go, no, go right I ahead. I just want to be sure that we're, we're clear on, on, my understanding is at this point, the applicant is proposing three affordable housing units in phase three. The, the change is previously phase one had zero, phase two was supposed to have one, phase two A was supposed to have two, and then phase three was supposed to have two more. So at the end of phase three, there were supposed to be a total of five. To date, and we've heard from the applicant before, he's tried to make the affordable housing component function in the earlier phases um, to no avail. Um, and so to date, phase two and 2A, 2B are essentially done. There haven't been any affordable housing units um, created for all intents and purposes. And what the applicant is now seeking is to do three units in at the, by the end of phase three. So instead of five, he's now proposing three. So I just want to be sure that and, that we're clear. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong in that, but that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's my understanding. So there will be, at least again, yeah. given what is proposed, the intent. The question, though, on that right. is, is the cart before the horse, or which way does it go? He's intending to do three instead of five. But is there a possibility that phase three can be done without any being done? Today, that's first. Okay. And, and again, I, I, I want to make it clear, I am not faulting the applicant here because I have seen certainly more than this uh, applicant have a problem trying to fill this type of housing need here in town. So I am truly not faulting them. I just, um, I, I don't want to continue to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the phasing and, and still not be able to reach some of the goals that we're trying to reach. So it's more of a comment. Um, another concern that I have, and again, you know, maybe it's the size of the drawing and I'm a proponent of 11 by 17, so I'm not trying to recant that. Um, but I, I, as we're making more and more of the changes, like some of the changes that we're proposing during this phasing, um, becoming more concerned that um, we, 
we need to make sure that the plans that are coming into town and getting recorded have some form of surveying uh, process put to them because I, I don't know what's happening in all of these boundaries. And I'm, I'm just, again, I'm, there's, there's no way I'm going to sit here and try to compare this phasing to the phasing that we, you know, this is the sixth revision. So I don't know what's happening, but we may need to start to um, consider the fact that, that we may need some boundary lines put on these drawings. Um, and my final comment is in regard to the new single family housing. In the past, in these areas, we've had very clear, clearly identified and shown access into the single into the the homes that we were doing. I, I think that line has become fuzzier now in terms of how are we physically going to, we're going to access them from the back, we're going to access them from the front. I, I don't know how we're going to do that. We had nice, clear an understanding off the alleyways on how we were going to access these properties. Now it's not clear anymore. So I would like to try to help staff in terms of um, being, a, being able to help them identify how we're going to access the properties. So that's clarification more than anything else, but um, something that I hope that we can try to do here so that we continue to try to clean up as much as we can or take, take the fuzziness out of this as we continue to move forward. So that's, that's my concerns. No. Carrie Anderson, um, <clears throat> uh, sole member of uh, Ballantyne Development. I believe the meets and bounds are on plans. Uh, they have been signed by a surveyor. Joe can answer more of that. I think it's maybe the size of the plans that makes it difficult to see given the number of lots. But on the plans, they do have meets and bounds. And the surveyors have uh, st stamped the plans. There's a mylar here tonight uh, that has a surveyor stamp Testing to that, Joe can speak more to that uh, just to address that particular issue. Um, as far as the trail goes, um, it was pushed into phase five. We've got a lot of off-site improvements. We've got a lot of on-site improvements in phase three um, before we can start to put any infrastructure in for obviously houses. And that's the reason why some of that work was pushed off uh, purely by economics. This phase of infrastructure here is $2 million. Uh, it's it just crazy what it costs these days to put infrastructure in, especially with development like this where you got granite curbing, sidewalks, street trees, and everything else. Affordable housing, I think it's important to uh, go back. Uh, I know you wanted to, uh, Susan, you're interested in, in talking about moving forward rather than looking back, but I think I need to talk about uh, history here for just a moment to give the board a sense of uh, kind of the struggles that we've had and how affordable housing actually got proposed. Uh, when I met with uh, Ron Owens early on before we brought this project fully to the town, I actually was the one that uh, proposed affordable housing. I was the one that brought it up. I was the one that said I was willing to do it. And I was the one that said that I thought that it was a social uh, responsibility uh, given its location and whatnot for the project. The project also, um, we, it's, it behooves us to get the affordable housing done. Um, the density bonus that was given to the project goes away fully if we don't do the affordable housing. So we lose not four or five units, we lose the bonus completely. Um, so uh, if we don't do it, we go back to what we would have had for normal density on an R4, which the property had originally when we came to the town. In order to take it from four units to the acre, which is what it was zoned for 30 or 40 years, to the five units to the acre, 
was through the density bonus and affordable housing. So if we don't do it, we go back to four. We we haven't gotten something that we shouldn't have gotten for nothing. So it behooves us to do that. In 2010 and two, to, to, 2010 to 2011, difficult time, we, uh, we constructed a house, got it framed, didn't finish it off inside, marketed it as an affordable units for nine months. And we didn't get anybody that stepped up to the plate. We then came back to the planning board, and I don't know if you remember this or not, Alan. I know you were chairman at the time. We came back to the town and asked to have that requirement waived in phase one due to the inability to get a buyer. But we had a, we had a house up, framed, not completed, but a significant investment trying to get it sold to an affordable buyer based on the housing guidelines that the town has. In 2012, we held a meeting right here in the chambers. Uh, town manager was here, town planner was here, myself was here, my wife was here. Um, and uh, a notice was sent out to all town employees uh, that we were going to be ha a marketing workforce housing, hoping to get um, an affordable buyer for Eastern Village. The only person who showed up was a fire chief and he was showing up just uh, out of curiosity as to what we were doing. 2014, we've run ads in the local papers uh, talking about workforce housing and that we have it available and that we are trying to do it. Um, when we have buyers that come through or buyers that call, uh, we mention to them if it's a neighborhood that doesn't, or if it's a price level that doesn't seem like it can meet their their uh, their um, uh, their budget, we mentioned them that we have a workforce housing program. Um, we had uh, two calls in the ads that we ran in two of the local papers uh, about a month, month and a half ago, and uh, out of two of those calls, only one was uh, one that uh, could possibly afford it and she's going to wait and see how phase three progresses. I can't tell you, I, oh, I've also met with the town planner in Cape Elizabeth, Maureen, to understand their affordable housing program and how they got it done in Cross Hill. I've talked with Cumberland uh, about their affordable housing program and what they're trying to do. I can't tell you what the, uh, what the problem is or what the answer is. Um, I do have my own opinion that there are people who just purely cannot afford to get to that level where the guidelines permit with the workforce housing to work or they make too much money. We have spoken to a couple people that we thought would work and by the time we went through the financials, they made too much money. I think there are people who are literally caught between not making enough and making too much. That's purely speculation. That's my own opinion. But, um, but it hasn't, it, it's not something that we have not put effort into. It's not something that we haven't spent money on to try and see uh, happen. And uh, we are going to, and I've mentioned this to, uh, to Dan, uh, town planner, and uh, to Tom Hall, I believe, uh, I mentioned it to him as well. We are, as part of phase three, gonna build a house and we're gonna complete it. And we're gonna market it, uh, complete it, 100%. And just market the heck out of it until we find somebody who meets the guidelines. That's the only thing that we haven't done yet, but that's a significant investment. Um, it'll have to be made with cash. There's not a bank in the land that will step up and support anything like that. Um, so I hope you can appreciate the undertaking that uh, goes with trying to make something like that happen. There's not a line of people that are standing in place willing to sign up for these, because uh, if there were, we'd already have some built. We've made it uh, known on the record at these meetings. We've made it known uh, in the local paper. Um, 
some of the real estate brokers that deal with affordable housing are aware of it. One of them who's on the Housing Alliance uh, knows about it. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, it's not as easy as it may sound, and I just uh, want you to, uh, to understand uh, kind of where, how it all became um, uh, uh, suggested by me to uh, the past uh, town manager, Ron Owens, um, and, uh, and, and what we've done and where we are and what we're going to try and do. Thank you. And Carrie, uh, what's, what's the price or price range of the affordable? Well, it, it, it's, it depends. It depends on what it's all based on the, uh, the, the um, and Brian's here. Brian can probably share with you more information on this than I can. My wife is working on the program. Um, I've obviously got my hands uh, full with other things, but it depends on how much you make. It depends on the number of members you have in the family. Um, it's um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, we actually prefer the way that Cape Elizabeth does it. I've discussed it with Tom Hall. Uh, Tom thinks that it might be more work for us to do it that way, but we think that if the town truly wants affordable housing, uh, that there ought to be every effort made to keep it affordable housing. And the way that the program is set up, and, and, and this incidentally, I think, may play a role in it as well. Um, somebody who, uh, you know, that you want to make sure that somebody who meets the guideline doesn't come in, take possession of the home, and then be able to sell it for what, you know, fair market value is in a year or two, uh, or a month, or two months, or whatever. Um, the way that the program is set up right now in Scarborough, is that the town would take a soft second so that the homeowner, if they meet the guideline, they buy the house and they decide to sell it two years from now, let's say there's a $50,000 profit, the town would get their soft second for whatever that number is, and then the homeowner would get you know, the balance if there is one. Uh, the way that, but, but, but with that, what, what you have is essentially you have an affordable housing unit that's built in place, but then you lose it. The town gets the money. They can go and reappropriate it, I suppose, but you lose that affordable unit. The town, the town of Cape Elizabeth, I favor their plan, and their plan is that um, there is no soft second. It puts more of a burden on the developer, uh, but um, that number that is determined to be the, uh, the sales price in 2014, presumably will go up in 2015, presumably will go up in 2016, and on and on and on. Well, that buyer, let's say five years from now, will have to sell the house for what will be deemed that number in 2020. But, they'll, it, but, it, will, but it will remain an affordable home, a workforce home, because an affordable buyer will then step in and buy it under those guidelines. We prefer that method. We think that it's, it's hard enough, as we all can see here, to get affordable housing built to begin with. And if it's built, let's try and keep it in place rather than seeing it go away and then the town reappropriating the money in some way that they do it. Um, so there's some disagreement that we have with that. Whichever way it goes, at the end of the day, I don't really care. I, I want to get them built. Um, but uh, but there's 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 some idiosyncrasies that make it a little bit more difficult too, and that's been something that with one particular buyer, um, we had to spend a lot of time with to get them to overcome. We actually well that's a long story, but they couldn't get over this, there was one party that we were working with, and they couldn't get over the fact that the town. Was, was getting a second mortgage on their, ho on their home. Now, they may have had a hidden agenda. We don't know. But the, it didn't come together. Um, but, you know, there's, there's some nuances to it. And it's not kind of a one-size-fits-all. Um, so, but, uh, but I give you my, my word that we are going to get a unit built in Phase 3. We're going to complete it, and we're going to market the heck out of it. 
and we'll find somebody who will move into it. Um, hopefully, we don't have to sit on it for too long. Mr. Chair, to the chair. Yes. And I just to say thanks to for you, Carrie for you bringing us up to date. And I also um, appreciate knowing um, the very differences between what might or might not happen in terms of making this easier. I'm also wondering, and I'm not saying this to you to answer it, but I'm also wondering if, with, in light of our next case, our, our next um, item, the Habitat for Humanity thing, is that there might be more um, focus coming into Scarborough in terms of, you know, we are making an effort to want to provide that kind of affordable housing, and we have other opportunities. There's an opportunity here for the town, not yourself, but to get on board with. We we don't only want to support affordable housing, we want to support workforce housing, and bring it, give it more publicity. Um, I live here, and I didn't know, so thank you. I'd like to also echo what Susan just said, Carrie puts a different perspective in my mind and a, a clearer picture of the situation. And I, I think it is a good door opener to our next application. Thank you. <coughs> Joe, just fr from a curiosity standpoint, what what is the timing here? What what what's this, what is what if anything is a sense of urgency? Where I guess what I'm trying to go to here is um, I know that staff would like to have an opportunity to review your comments more mm -hmm. before we approve. Certainly, the board has not seen any of those as of yet. Um, if if we delay action on this for three weeks, what are we doing to the applicant? Would you like to answer that one, Carrie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah. even believe I asked you that question, Carrie. But well, to be honest with you, it's a major problem, major problem. We've got a lot of work we've got to get completed. We've got a limited window to get it done. We're talking about weather events. We're talking about paving events, when they open, when they close. This is a big. This is a lot of work, and uh, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know about the staff comments part. I know that there was a little bit of a confusion that we had with, and I'm not throwing you under the bus, Jay, but I saw in one of the uh, responses or to the comments there that you weren't going to be back until late Tuesday, which kind of threw me off because I didn't realize that the planning board meeting was Tuesday. I thought it was Monday, and I thought, well, how's that going to work? But Joe and I, once we went through that, we understood that. But, um, but, but to be to be right up front with you, I need an approval tonight. I got to get started on this project. Um, we've got uh, two massive ponds out there to build. One of them, 16,000 yards of materials coming out of. We've got to put a box culvert in. That's uh, where there's a crossing right now where it's failed, which is what's washing out the road. Um, you know, that's before we can even start working on the project. Um, so, I, as far as staff comments go, I mean, I would, I, and again, with all due respect to the board, but I would think that that uh, the staff, um, it would staff, if, if they're comfortable with with our responses, then um, then we should be afforded a uh, an approval. And, and that's not to say that I don't think that anybody who's sitting up here giving their time, uh, volunteering their time, is their, their input's not important. But I don't think that there's anything in the comments and in the responses that aren't kind of what we're, where we've already been, what this project's about, what, we're, where, what we've talked about in the past. Um, you know, the only thing of it is, to be honest with you, that I see is, is, is really the, the typology. You know, the phasing, we're just changing the phasing. The six lots that we added, well, we, the only reason we withdrew those before is because we didn't want to rip a brand new road up to put in the public sewer when we had a private sewer across the street. But the sanitary district's not going to budge on that, so we'll go rip the road up and put a sewer in so we can make it public instead of private when the private's from no, from, no further from me to, than the cameraman away. 
Um, the typologies, to me, is really the thing. And, um, you know, this is what a carriage house looks like. Um, we're trying to, you know, if you had something like this in a peninsula in Portland, you'd have, uh, you'd have a line of people ready to buy it the first day it went on the market. True. We're trying to put them down into Eastern Village. It's another way of trying to bring the cost of housing down. But when you really look at what our request is before you, I don't think that there's anything that's new here. Everything is, everything is kind of the same. We've been over it. Uh, we've been over it back when we got our approval. Most of it has come up when we've had our amendments. Um, I've addressed the affordable housing as, as, as honestly and as best I can. But um, and I really do. I need an approval. I don't have any problem with that. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. I just think that we, we went around the board and nobody really, we all essentially said that the three things that were being requested we didn't really have any problems with. But we all wanted to know more about affordable housing. But it's a, it's a, it's a call from the chair. That's why we elected. Uh, that's why I get all the money, right? That's why you yeah. get the big bucks. Um, other comments, gentlemen? I mean, I know... John, you were concerned about a couple of items, not just mm -hmm. affordable housing. Um, you know, I don't want to... I don't think that necessarily stopped me on the project. It's just an opinion that I felt would be done in this phase and not wait till five, but yep. it's not a deal breaker. Okay. I'm okay. <coughs> on this end, anybody else? Dick, Dave? project's been under construction for quite a while. It's been here for a long time. The developer's been here for a long time. He's done a lot of work here, so he's not going anywhere. I, I, Mr. Chair, just a question I have, and, and I know the applicant's conferring with his engineer, so I don't want to. Um, one of the, I think it sounds like ostensibly the board and staff is generally fine with the proposal, but there are some changes to the lot layouts um, that were formerly single-family lots where the road alignment has changed. Um, minor changes, but changes. And we haven't seen those detailed plans. So I guess the only question staff would really um, is struggling with is, staff's generally comfortable with the board doing a condition of approval, but we're, I'm not quite convinced that you're in a position to sign the plans tonight where we haven't yet reviewed the details of the road alignment changes. Or And, and so those are some of the questions that we have. And, and um, with with um, understanding Mr. Carey's concern, there are huge infrastructure uh, components with Phase 3. Um, I guess I would ask, where Phase 3 has been approved, the stormwater pond, for example, the big stormwater pond, that's not really changing. The box culvert isn't changing with this. The road, the, the road alignment through Phase 3, for the most part, isn't changing. It seems like a significant amount of the work could probably still begin under the guise of the existing approval while we work out the details of the proposal. I, am I, is that a fair assessment? And because, um, you know, I, understanding the board's interest in working with the applicant and staff that certainly um, wants to work with the applicant as well to move something forward that we all believe will wind up in, a, in you know, we're headed towards an approval, but there are certain T's to be crossed and I's dotted that we, in staff's assessment, we haven't quite seen yet. Um, so I guess that's the question I would have. Is it, given, given that there are the box, box culvert being one of the significant items you just referenced, it seems to me that that work could begin regardless, um, and, and maybe I'm missing something in that regard. Um, well, actually, that work can't begin until July 15th due to some of the stream alteration okay. uh, issues that the state has. But there's other work that we need to get going on. That's just another part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, and you're right, we do have an approval for phase three. So our request for these changes is what we believe to make it a better plan. Um, I do believe the town engineer has had those plans for, um, they were given to them, I know, sometime last week. But if you haven't seen them, uh, I'm not sure. Joe can probably speak to that more. Um, Those are the phase three plans. 
correct? They're, they're not, they don't sort of get into the changes in phase. I think it's four or five. Again, sort of that area where, the, where you're building the, uh, instead of what were, I think, three single family lots, you now have four limited single family with sort of the green space. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know that, the, you know, one of the questions that was sort of raised was, during the original approval, the access was understood to be coming off the alleyways. Well, now it seems that there's a couple uh, limited single-family lots where the access can only come off the main road. Yep. And in those are the type of details that I don't think staffs had time to appreciate, and certainly I don't think the board um, yet appreciates those type of changes. And so I think, again, I don't think that there's a problem in getting to an approval, but just making sure that we, it is a very complex and nuanced project. And um, that's hasten to sort of rush through where, I think to your concern, it seems like a lot of the work that you want to get underway could probably get under the way, underway with the existing approval. And, and that would afford everyone the time to really work sequentially through these very nuanced um, uh, amendments. Again, I understand that you know it's minor road alignment. <coughs> I, 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 you know, I sort of looked at that, but it's typically those are the details we look at prior to the board granting approval and signing a plan. So, um, if the board's comfortable, staff stands prepared to support the board in whatever direction they wish to go. Um, but I just feel it's important that I lay out sort of all you know staff's um, understanding of what of where we're at. I understand. Um, I think, uh, I, and with respect to that area there that you're talking about, with, as far as phase four goes, um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly down the road. I think that what's, what's important for us is obviously an approval to the new phasing, which presumably is not an issue. Uh, Joe, is there uh, anything else that you can think of that addresses their concern, uh, because I don't, you know, I mean, I agree with you. If uh, that's a that's a phase that's down the road, we can get you that information to to make sure that everybody is all set with that. Um, yeah, actually, what Carrie and I were talking about was the same direction you were going in uh, today. Was that you know he certainly I, I I agree. I think a lot of the stuff that is in the original, what's in phase three today, is the same phase three and four. What's different is it's not a lot configuration from that, like 103, 105, and the six added lots that are out on Valentine Way, which Gary would probably, even that's not the first place we started. So I think there definitely is time for that. And, 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 you know, and I haven't, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it helps if I can just give you an explanation as to why we made those changes. It enhances the plan a little bit. Um, if I'll just take a second here. The, this, this area right here, uh, where we made these changes uh, to what used to be four lots, we've now added a carriage lot. We've got another carriage lot here, and then we created this park space that all of these homes front up against, which again is kind of building building on what we what we're trying to do. This area down here in phase four, what we've done here is we've created like this lineage park goes through three blocks and houses that can front out on it. Again, I think, it, I think everybody probably support, again, the, the concept of what we're trying to do, but with respect to how we're going to access those and whatnot, yep, I get it. I understand what you're saying. Um, it would be good if we had these right here. They would be accessed, uh, the, the back two would be accessed from lot 106. 105A, 104B, 104, and 103A would be accessed from the alley. Obviously, these other three would be accessed off a classical way. Um, but, yeah, are we going to be up there working in that area there in three weeks? Uh, probably not. Um, Harry, can I, can I make a suggestion? Sure. I, I think what, because the other thing I don't want you to have to do either, and I, I don't like applicants to have to do this just for the sake of doing it. I don't want to have to come back and have a, a full show at the next planning board meeting just because we're doing some cleanup things. I mean, if the board is okay with this, I would propose that you work with town staff over the next couple of weeks, clean 
the areas up that they have concerns on and that we treat this as a consent item at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. You don't have to come back full force. Don't have to bring your engineers. You don't even have to be here if you don't need to. As long as staff is content with the cleanup, we'll just handle it as a consent item. Because I think everybody's okay with what we're seeing. We just want to make sure that we clean it up a little bit before we actually sign the mylar. Okay. I understand. I just have one question. Does that, does that uh, have any issue with, with respect to the LOC? Okay. I'm prepared to post a letter of credit, you know. Yeah. That, we were hoping to get a signed Mylar record, record the plan tomorrow, but I guess we can go based on what we've got for, a, for a, a, an approved phase three now, uh, move forward under that, that item, get it, get it as a consent, address Jay's concerns, and, and if everybody's happy there, then I think that works for us. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not miles apart here. We're, we're talking inches, and... It's just it's cleanup, yep. and, and so if we if we're signing a mylar, it would be good if we got it right. Yep. And and let me just say I didn't I didn't fully uh, appreciate where, where you were coming from, Jay, with respect to that. When we when you were talking about the responses, I didn't I wasn't understanding that you were getting more into cross sections and profiles. Um, I thought we were talking about kind of a lot of the items that we'd already yeah. addressed. So uh, you know my apologies there. And also, again, just a comment for me. I mean, I do fully appreciate everything that you have gone through on the affordable housing, and, and I, clearly I do not want you to think in any way, shape, or fashion that that I or I think any member of this board does not believe you're not doing the right things, okay? It's, it's again, it's, it's one of those, this is a, a, an ongoing item that we see from developers here in town trying to make this happen. And I appreciate the pain and do not show, or I'm not trying to indicate in any way, shape, or fashion, fault on anything that you've done to try to make it happen. So I appreciate what you're trying to do. All right? Superb. I'm good. All set? All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. What? What I would like to do, and thank you, um, what I'd like to do is to uh, take a five-minute recess yeah. and uh, start back here at 9.22.
requires a lot of effort on their part and on our part, and we can't just. Um, would you be willing to think that that's a good charge now? I don't think that's a good charge. Welcome everybody back to the uh, planning board meeting for April 22nd, 2014. Our next item on the agenda this evening is Habitat for Humanity. Request a sketch plan review for a 13 lot residential subdivision at 75 Broad Turn Road in the VR2 zone. Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the property that's proposed to be developed is currently a town-owned parcel, which was purchased in 2006 for the express use of creating affordable housing as well as for land conservation open space. Um, for the past number of years, Habitat and the town have been uh, exploring the creation of low and moderate income housing, um, and subsequently the council entered into an agreement with Habitat um, to enable them to move forward with the housing development um, with the housing development on a portion of the property. Um, to that end, is this board's charge to review this application through the regulatory role that you have through the subdivision review ordinance and the provisions of the um, VR2. Um, the VR2, uh, the purpose of the VR2 is to allow for moderate density residential development. The zone, zone district has five village development standards which are to be met uh, for all residential subdivisions, and those are expressively spelled out right in the VR2 ordinance uh, it, uh, district. Uh, in reviewing these standards, staff provided uh, a couple of comments to the board and applicant to think about in reviewing the sketch plan. Again, this is a sketch plan, so this is an opportunity for the board to sort of take a high-level review of what's being proposed and 
just voice any concerns you may have that you want the applicant to address as they put together their formal application. Um, to that end, a couple of the items that staff laid out you might want to consider is the uh, street design with regards to the width of the street, sidewalks, street trees, um, and how those are going to uh, function. Uh, one question staff had that we didn't see uh, represented in the narrative or on the plan was sort of what is the um, uh, potential for a trail connection or, or readily, readily available public access to the remaining open space back land? You know, is there opportunity for one or two parking spaces, you know, um, informal as they may be, something that uh, makes the area accessible to the general public? Um, uh, let's see. Um, I guess the only other item that we'd add with regards to sort of a detailed comment uh, the plan that was submitted shows some landscape buffering on the abutting MTA property, um, Turnpike Authority property, and of course um, they would need authority uh, and approval by the MTA to do that. Um, I just raised that now just so it's not a surprise later, but I don't think it's a, a big area of concern moving forward. But um, that is a summation of staff comments to date. All right. Thank you, Jay. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome yes. back. Thank you. Chairman, members of the board, Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil, uh, here this evening representing uh, Habitat for Humanity, and uh, the pleasure to be joined this evening by Mark Primo uh, from Habitat, and uh, he will be available to answer any specific questions about Habitat and about the virtual algorithm that uh, Carrie had alluded to last time about how the uh, prices are set. Um, before I go any further, though, I'd mention that uh, Dave, in answer to your question to Carrie previously, in this particular case regarding affordable housing, the cap is at $190,000. So that gives you an idea, or gives the town the idea of what we're actually looking at as far as what determines affordability. And that's a cap. That doesn't mean that they're going to be that way. It could be actually a little bit less. Um, the, uh, the previous project was a great segue into this one. Uh, every once in a while, we, uh, well, we have a lot of great projects to be sure, but every once in a while we have the privilege to be associated with one that is just really cool all the way around. And this appears to be one of these. It's a great project. It's a great organization. Uh, the uh, Habitat for Humanity, perhaps because of its name, has a significant pool of waiting applicants that would like to be able to get into affordable housing. Um, it's a wonderful project as far as affordable housing in a residential community into which an awful lot of people would like to move and, and can't really, in some cases, because of the affordable issue. Uh, that comes down to that old uh, analogy of you know, the fire fireman can get to the fire faster if he actually lived in the community in which he worked, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Scarborough is a wonderful community as far as uh, residential housing is concerned, but obviously it's a little bit limited uh, through no fault of the town as far as its affordability, and we aim to be able to change that a bit. Uh, and finally, one of the other things that makes this particular site absolutely wonderful for us is that it's going to be on town water and sewer, and uh, we have a CDBG grant, a uh, community development block grant that has been granted that is going to be uh, offsetting a good portion of the cost of bringing in public sewer 1,200 linear feet through an awful lot of ledge that would otherwise make it perhaps uh, cost prohibitive for a lot of developers to try to do this in conjunction with this type of project where it is, it just makes it even more affordable as far as getting the uh, public utilities out to that particular area. Um, one of the, uh, th the things that I would like to do this evening is uh, reiterate what Jay has already said and that we're not asking for any approvals this evening, but we would like to solicit as much of your, many of your comments and as much of your feedback as we can that will allow us to go forward relatively quickly here to be back before you when we will start asking for uh, specific approvals. So as soon as I'm finished with a brief presentation, if you would, please feel free to be very candid and let us know uh, what you think is, is great about it, what you think may be uh, either problematic or, or any issues that you might see that you would like to be able to have addressed. Uh, Jay brought up a couple of things that I would like to address specifically regarding the project, and that is the uh, reduction of street width. We have right now, well, I tell you what, before we start there, let me just give you a quick orientation as to what's going on. Um, this is off of uh, Broad Turn Road. This is the turnpike. Uh, Broad Turn Road, as it uh, comes down toward the turnpike, uh, hits a lower area right in here and starts coming up over the bridge. This is town-owned property in this section. Uh, as Jay mentioned, it was acquired in 2006, and we're proposing to be able to put these number of lots in in this configuration, or very similar to this, as you see it. Uh, this is a residential subdivision. It's all, well, most of Scarborough is residential, particularly in this particular area, and we're just looking to augment that, uh, providing 13 new units for 
people who would love to be able to live here and otherwise haven't been able to found, find a, uh, uh, either a house or a series of houses from which they can choose that would actually meet their criteria. We think this is going to change that. As far as the street width is concerned, Jay had mentioned that uh, because of the uh, VR2 zone, uh, we would be eligible for uh, streets that are not quite as wide as they would be under the public domain. Typically, that's 22 to 24 feet wide. In this case, the regulation does allow us to go down to 20 feet of paved width. Now, keep in mind that this is not uh, the narrowing the entire street, including its subgrade. The fire department still has to weigh in and say, we've got to get our, be able to get two fire trucks back and forth in any situation. So we're looking at subgrade materials with shoulders, basically, that will still uh, act as any public street would, uh, but the width of the actual traveled way, the asphalt, as, you, as it were, uh, will be a bit narrower. It gives it a little bit more of a rural character, keeps it a little bit more homey, given that this is not really a cul-de-sac, but it's a looped road. It's only got one access point. Um, it keeps it uh, a little bit more uh, rural toward that end. And uh, we just think that that's a, uh, a better effort to be able to have streets that look a little bit narrower or are a little bit narrower than they might otherwise be in the public domain. Uh, as far as sidewalks are concerned, we do recognize that sidewalks are necessary here, and we do propose them. Uh, as you'll see here, we've actually got a uh, sidewalk coming in from Broad Turn, uh, right over in this section, and it, uh, it meets up in this area and then works to the middle, which is typically where everybody tends to congregate in any given house or any given development. We kind of work toward the middle, toward that end, so we are certainly proposing uh, the sidewalks that will go in there as well. Uh, there was also a comment about um, some uh, trees. We've got an awful lot of trees that are in that area. Obviously, we're going to be clearing out some of them for the road and some of the lots. Some of those lots are fielded right now. Uh, in any areas where we do have a, a dearth of trees when we're created, we, when the lots are done, we'd be happy to actually uh, put a, a couple of street trees toward that end. But fortunately, in this particular area, it's rather heavily naturally landscaped, and we want to leave that uh, to the greatest extent feasible. Toward that end, as far as landscaping is concerned, I'm going to skip to the bottom of this list that uh, Jay had provided. And uh, I was talking about the landscape buffering that we show uh, on this landscaping plan. There's a couple of uh, uh, proposed trees and other bushes that are actually off the property. We're not proposing that anymore. That was more for this is where we're planning to be able to do some type of planting. Uh, we do not need to go off of our property as far as that's concerned. So when we do come back here officially uh, asking for approvals, you won't see the, anything that's off the property toward that end. Also toward that end, instead of planting a huge number of trees on top of a very large berm, because we are next to the turnpike, we're actually proposing a stockade-style fence uh, that will do uh, serve multiple purposes. One is from safety, and uh, even more than that is really to uh, tone down the level, the volume of the noise of the turnpike uh, regarding this particular area. So that has a, a double view as well. Uh, trail connection that Jay brought up. There are actually two areas that we would propose for uh, ostensible public access, certainly for the people who are going to be living there. And because this is going to be a proposed for a public street, any member of the public can come in here and, and use it as well. Typically what that would be is uh, an access over in this particular area and this section right through here. This upper one that you see here has got a small, I wouldn't say it's a ravine, but it's a significant drainage swale, so it's not really conducive to a pathway, although anybody can certainly walk through that. Uh, it's not a ravine, it's just a, 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 a relatively uh, a, shallow swale but with steep sides to it. This area is absolutely conducive to be able to allow access uh, into the back acreage. When you're looking at this, and obviously we don't show the overall acreage, it goes considerably further off of the plan, but we're only developing about a quarter of a third of the overall property. The rest of it is going to be left as open space. Uh, we have no objection whatsoever, as Jade mentioned, if we'd like to put a couple of uh, parking spaces, we can actually put a couple right in this area. Uh, we don't have a problem doing that. That would allow members of the public, you and me, to be able to pop over there and take advantage of a, a walk through the woods if we wish. So we're happy to be able to do that. Uh, the uh, staff had mentioned that it encourages um, future submission materials that would have a written narrative describing how the uh, proposal relates to the standards. And I'd like to go over those standards very, very quickly just so that you understand very quickly what they are. And then obviously we'll go through it in more detail later on. Those five standards are essentially create a grid or uh, lots that are basically created in a grid style pattern, uh, meaning nothing too funky looking. These lots are relatively basic as we go around the uh, uh, what we'll call the cul-de-sac or the loop road. Uh, the street width, which we already discussed, we would uh, be very interested in keeping that at 20 feet as far as the traveled way. Uh, sidewalks in the trees, we discussed that. Uh, there's an alleyway concept that doesn't really refer to this or pertain to this particular project at all, so we're not even, we don't need to go there. 
and then last but not least is the open space, and we meet all of this criteria. So toward that end, it's, a, uh, it's an excellent project uh, given that. And uh, we will end up uh, removing those trees that are proposed that are off the site, and then we shouldn't have any further problems toward that end. So given that, what we'd love to be able to do is um, present you with considerably greater information of a more engineering detailed uh, a specific when we're back next time, but at this point I'd love to be able to, to solicit any comments from the board as to what you might like to see, anything that is particularly a concern of yours, and we'll go from there. Excellent. Thank you. John? I'll make some comments. I was on the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Do you want to explain how many meetings, neighborhood meetings you've had to, as this thing progressed forward? Um, we, we've had several. I don't actually know the number of those, but uh, Mark, if you've Four. got... Four. And they basically addressed a lot of the concerns of the neighborhood. This is this originally was about twice the size, am I right? Yes. The number of lots? That's correct. So they listened to the neighborhood and shrunk it down in size. Uh, I like the looks of this one much better than the other one. So. Go ahead. Please state your name and address for the record. Primo with uh, Habitat. For Thank you. Development associate with Habitat. We had originally uh, looked at this as uh, 17, 24 units before that, um, and you know, the more we got into it, the, the we really believe that that single family uh, homes are the way to go. Uh, we believe that the dream of home ownership is is more powerful if it's a single family home as opposed to a duplex. Um, so we we did hear that in the neighborhood uh, meetings, and we we also believe it's a better product for our, our families. You know, the comment I had, uh, the only person was at your last meeting, Mr. Bowser, Neil Bowser, who lives right there, that first lot. He's got a concern I can deal with later with the school department. Basically, uh, the bus is stopping on that hill, even though we've decreased the speed. Just a matter of asking the school department, obviously, to pick up the kids outbound and to drop them off. Mm. They'll pick them up in the morning and at nighttime drop them off the same way outbound so that the kids aren't crossing the street. And that's the only concern Mr. Bowser really had. He put a lot of stuff forward, but he was, that's the one he brought the most to me. And he lived it, so he knows what the traffic's like. That's all I've got. All right, thank you. Ron? Yeah, you must have listened closely because you've addressed a lot of the things. You must have anticipated some of my questions. But uh, the schematics that I have of the houses, uh, I, you're going to vary the... the, the uh, the styles, or are they all going to be the same? You get to choose. No, there are uh, <laughs> several different concepts. Uh, it gets a little tedious if they're all exactly the same, so yeah. we'll have to try to break those up a little bit more. Uh, as far as the affordability is concerned, they're all, from a material standpoint, they're all generally the same as far as the uh, uh, quality of workmanship and the cost, but there is a little bit of variance that just kind of breaks things up a bit. Okay. and and. One thing, and you anticipated, I was going to ask uh, how you're going to uh, block some of the noise from the turnpike to the project, and you answered that with the uh, stockade f fence, and I was I was glad to hear that because uh, for the convenience of the occupants, you know, as much as you can do that, uh, that would be great. Um, what else did I have? Oh, wetland. Is there any wetland on, on, on the property? There are no wetlands that are on our area of the property. There are wetlands on the property. As Susan mentioned earlier, you can't really get too many places in Scarborough anymore where you're not going to encounter some wetlands. Um, the biggest wet area of wetland we have is this cross-section. That's essentially what this line shows. Uh, we don't need to go near there, relatively speaking. Uh, the, um, the access, it, it's not a huge stream. I mean, it's, you, know, you can kind of jump over it. Um, that's fairly easy. But no, there are no specific wetlands that we have to worry about in our section. You, know, you seem to have answered everything else. So I've made notes. I'm all done. Okay, thank you. Sue? Yay. <laughs> this is very exciting. It really is very exciting. And I like what you're doing. I love the uh, fact that we're going to get a choice of essentially same size housing, but different ways of doing it. Yep, yeah, great. One of the most important things that's happened so far, other than the fact that this actually came together, the town and Habitat working together, is you went to the neighborhood meetings. I mean, you created neighborhood meetings. I just That's one of the things that in the last four or five years I've just become an advocate for right up front. 
find out where you're going to be, whatever you're doing, and interact with the people around you because, you know, you're bringing in people that are going to be your neighbors and you want the neighborhood to know what's happening. So that was totally brilliant and congratulations to you. Um, yes to the parking spaces to access the back. And I have no idea what's out there right now. I mean, is it just any trails, anything? Not really. Mm, no, it's, it's forested. Okay. Um, people like the Land Trust know a lot about creating trails, and I bet that considering this is Habitat, if you get in touch with some of these people about bringing out scouts and other outdoor activities, the kids get to do it. They get adult supervision. There's all kinds of programs around the greater Portland area to do that. So I can see that once it gets built and people start moving in, that's the thing that the neighborhood could perhaps do with you know, build trails. Absolutely. Little, little places, little benches and things. I'm getting carried away, but I think it's very exciting. Um, the only thing I would really like to see, which I suppose is not possible, but I'm going to put it out there anyway, is that this just cries for a couple of benches and a couple of trees and a picnic table right smack dab in the middle. I bet you can't do it because you haven't got enough land. But look at the way it's laid out. you got a center. And wouldn't it be wonderful? I'm going to make your day. A lot. <laughs> One of these lots right yeah. here is not actually a lot. It isn't? Uh, it's not a housing lot. It says lot 13 on it. It's a, Well, it's a lot because we create it that way. Ah. But it's not a buildable lot. Thank you. Um, it is not proposed for oh. any construction. It's going to be a common... It's like a village green. Exactly. Yes. Oh, you did make my day. You made my day. Okay. Careful clearing of wherever there are trees, obviously. We all know to do that. Um, stockade fence. Which is the stockade fence? Is that the one that always falls over? that close to the turnpike, we'll put more for the noise abatement. That's the only thing that concerns me is safety and noise. Not safety as much because a stockade fence would do that, but I don't know about noise and stockade fence because once you actually move in there, I mean, you know, I'm not saying that you need to do what they did on I-90, on 295 in South Portland. I mean, that's a major undertaking. But those houses are right up against 295, right? This is back more, but it's up. Isn't it? Um, it's up slightly. It's not up as much as you might think. A lot no, of us, when we drive out broad turn, no, we start going up because we're going over the bridge. Okay. But the topography is relatively consistent. Relatively, okay, so there's not going to be a lot of the sound rising thing. Well, actually, there is. Um, the, the sound typically rises, hits the fence, and while you're going to hear ambient noise no matter where you are, the predominant noise actually hits a buffer such as that and then tends to travel straight up. Okay. I would just like to comment on the noise. As, as part of this uh, project, there's the community development block grant money, which uh, is, is flows from HUD, so it triggers HUD review of this from a sound attenuation. Um, and we were w required by HUD to go through their worksheets to show the necessary sound attenuations, and we were able to achieve that with the stockade fence. Well, there you go. I don't have any other questions. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I'll just start by saying it's a nice project. This, this is great for Scarborough. Um, I just had a question regarding the, the neighbors, the abutters, uh, whether or not they had participated in some of those neighborhood meetings and whether they had any concerns regarding if there were to be a parking spaces and a trail that leads to this back area, whether or not some of their property might be impacted or they were worried about uh, people just kind of wandering around on their property. Is there, is there any discussion of that or any or any talk of maybe putting in a small, some sort of small, you know, post and, and uh, rail type of fence system or something just to kind of delineate a little bit? Um, there wasn't any specific conversation about that, um, as I understand it from all the meetings. There were a lot of a lot of people could have showed up and didn't. There were very few that actually did. Um, those that did, uh, did have some um, interesting comments. That was not amongst them, from what I remember. There is sort of a, uh, you can see it from here, there is sort of a natural buffer between, in our housing area, uh, between the houses that are in the development immediately adjacent to it, which is the tree line right through here. Uh, as far as connections are concerned to that, we're not proposing any connections, just uh, direct connections into that development. That development's already been there for many years. Um, people will do what they want to do, especially if they're kids. 
they'll probably go anywhere, and in some cases they're probably going to be encouraged to play with the kids in the other neighborhood, et cetera. But we're not proposing to do a direct connection to that neighborhood primarily because there's no easements for us to take advantage of on those lots. Let me just answer your question. Yep, I'm mostly, yeah, I'm also. Okay. Great, thanks. Dave? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I like the concept. I, I like the variety of the modest homes. Uh, it's always nice to see variety in the subdivision instead of, you know, identical houses. Um, however, I would change this layout. I would flip it so lots four, five, six, seven would be away from the highway. You know what I'm saying? Oh. Yeah, I would put them against the other boundary to get them away from the highway. You mean over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that would be great. Unfortunately, the only access that we have is a very narrow strip for right here. Um, if we were to come in this way, I'm not sure that we could actually. I don't know. I don't know how we could actually put lots over here. You, you couldn't turn that road and kind of follow the existing the old driveway and then go in. You mean the driveway down here? Yeah. That's on another. Well, that's property. not on our property. Oh, it isn't. No. Th what you see right here, essentially, this is the property that we've got available. Oh. Okay. So it's well, a who, great idea. But who owns that? This is Department of Transportation, main DOT. Okay. Uh, and th this is actually the their uh, access, like well, access. obviously the access to the, uh, and you the turn turnpike. Like that, and this okay. Okay. They keep a boneyard here when they do it work over in this area. Okay. And you couldn't, you couldn't go in and then angle the, the road to connect to the circle? Well, anything is possible, to be sure. Um, I think it's more of a challenge this way because this is our only access right here. If we were to try to come in this direction, I think we would end up um, stymieing the ability to be able to create the lots according to the grid concept, which is what the, re the regulation is all about. If it were over here, that would be a no-brainer. We'd be coming in straight in here and probably have some type of loop road or cul de sac okay. here with lots on both sides. Uh, this is not the most cost-effective type of doing a road because obviously you, know, you want to create a road initially and then have houses or, or have lots immediately adjacent to them. Uh, this costs a fair amount of money just to get here before the houses are there. So it's not ideal, but it's the absolutely the most ideal given what <coughs> we're going to work with. Yeah. Okay. I, that makes sense. Uh, where would the fence be? Is, is that that the white dotted? The fence is actually oh, there. Okay. right over here and then come down this way, just like this. What's the other line? That white dotted line along the, highway? No, along the highway? I believe that's the Oh, that's the turnpike line. That's the difference between the Department of Transportation line and the turnpike line. Oh, okay. Line. All right. Okay. I guess I'm all set. Um, a lot of the things that I was looking at have already been talked about. I don't want to um, go over more and more, but I just want to be assured, and I know that you already addressed it, but Absolutely no wetlands on private property, correct? <laughs> we will have the wetlands delineation of the property specifically outlined for you. And okay. we know the regulation to the extent that if there are any whatsoever, then we're going to show those right up front. We've already done the wetlands delineation. We, I just don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. I just, I, Jim, you know me. I have a thing Absolutely. with wetlands on private property. So I just want to ask the question. Um, Kind of a crazy one, but has there been any thought given to any kind of endangered species or fauna in this area? You mean searching for it? Yes. You don't go normally looking for that. Uh, yeah, but I appreciate that. So <laughs> I'm just asking the question. Right. This will require a stormwater permit, which means that the DEP does get a chance to be able to review it. And as you're probably aware, um, irrespective of the type of permit, once a project gets before a state agency, DEP, the DOT, IFNW, or whatever, it opens up the entire project for scrutiny. Uh, so toward that end, if there are any endangered species, the right. spotted salamander, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that somebody may have recognized out there or thinks they might, we will be the second to know. Okay. The DEP will tell us. Don't we do that instead of the DEP now? Uh, Only well, for site law project, not stormwater permits. But there's nothing that they're doing. 
that we would do other than the deep and not the DEP? What what is it called? That thing that we just got. Site law. Site law. Site law. Right. Site so, we, so we now have municipal capacity, but this application, the does scope not. of this does not trigger site law. We oh. still don't have municipal capacity for stormwater. Okay. Whether we'll get there or not is a whole different question, but we have site law. Okay. Thank you. I love the concept. I like what you're doing. I'm, I'm hoping that you have overflow applicants and you direct them to carry. <laughs> Chair, um, I have a question before you. Keep that in mind. Yeah. No, no issues with road length or anything in terms of second egress or None. we're good there. Because it's a looped road. Yeah. Right. It, so it's the only, the only access or the only issue where that comes up is this section of the road right here. Because it's a looped road, this is all we have to worry about. We're nowhere close. Right. Maximum law distance. Okay. I, I'm not trying to bring up. No, I wish you would. Problems, I'm trying to eliminate them. Sure. No, this is what we're here for. Um, Don't uh, waste time next time. Are you thinking or planning on doing any kind of lighting or anything? Yes, there will be. Uh, uh, all the utilities will be subgrade, by the way. Yep. Um, and there will be street lighting. There will be a, a Cobra style light at the beginning or at the uh, entrance from Broadway, and then we will have the lighting throughout. Um, I can't tell you at the moment how many lights that will be. Uh, keeping in mind that this overall project is somewhat limited in cost, which doesn't mean that we're going to ask for a lot of waivers for something that would otherwise be required. Um, but because, as uh, Mark had mentioned, that there are some limitations in terms of the overall pool of money that's available to do the build out, we are limited in some respects. What that means is that instead of maybe eight lights or something, we may have three yeah. to that effect. And we will certainly show those when we come back with the engineered design. Try to keep them as low as we can and, you know. Absolutely. Things of that nature. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. You got a funky little triangle on the <laughs> west corner. What, what, what's that all about? That is for the uh, uh, fence, for the uh, uh, fencing that we want to be able to have uh, in part because of the, uh, the noise. So instead of actually coming at a 90 degree, okay. we're actually kind of segueing that through. Got it. So is that considered open space then? Um, or yeah. Quasi. It's part of open space, but it is going to be more quasi because nobody's really going to be able to get to it. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you know what currently exists between lot 9 and lot 10, Jim? Easternmost part, yeah. It's gray. Okay. I, the coloring just seemed. Maybe it's just the way that the, um, you know, the, the the plan was drawn, but it just looked like it was an overlay. So I didn't know if that was uh, some kind of waterway or. No, it's a scrub shop. The only type of waterway that we really have there naturally now is a pre-condition um, or a pre-construction condition is this little swale that comes right down through here, which kind yep. of gathers the water and just channels it this way. Okay. We're still going to be taking advantage of that. We're not changing that dynamic at all. Okay. And it's going to be like a public road, public, uh, public. Uh, yes. Uh, be, we trash collection, all of that yes. other good stuff, right? Once it's all completed and built out fully. Okay. I think that's. You know, based on what we're looking at so far, that's that's probably um, the most of my the most of my questions. I see that you actually did put the crosswalk on the plan. It's good. Now the question is, is what's it going to be made of? But I'll let that one go. All right, all right, I'll let that go. Right. The road will be paved too, by the way. All right. <laughs> No, it's good. I, I, I think it's great. Bring it on. Mr. Show Chair, us more. I've got a question. Oh, sorry, Ron. Um, Jim, there's an access road that maybe the main turnpike is so yes. Do they use it often? Um, it's not utilized as much now as it was when the, uh, the bridge was being redone. Uh, but every once in a while at bridge accesses, you'll see if you drive up and down the turnpike, you'll see that as an emergency access for state vehicles only, ostensibly. 
um, it allows emergency access, but that's gated. Right down. You can't get on, on or off the turnpike without. Uh, I, I understood you can't go onto the turnpike. I was just wondering about the, you know, buses going in or children coming in and out. And I'm looking ahead at whether or not that was an issue as far as the main turnpike is already using that for traffic. No, there will be a small easement right down in this section that will allow them to be able to keep their road there. But it won't interfere with any. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. You know, in terms of the bus issue, and I haven't really gone, I haven't driven by the property, so I'm not sure of the hill situation, but, you know, maybe, maybe, if there, you might want to consider a little <laughs> turn off area, or I'll call it, with a place for the children to get out of the weather kind of thing, right there toward the end of that road, if that's. Uh, it's something we can certainly consider, and this is actually a question for Jay, and I'm not sure that you know this or not. Is Once this becomes a publicly accepted road, is there any provision in Scarborough that prevents a bus from actually going into this development? That's really at the school, it's the school board or the school body's decision as to what their bus route looks like. So sure. no, if it's a public road, then. What I've generally seen is it's age-driven. Sure. Yeah. The younger the child, the more likely that they'll go into the development. By the time you reach middle school, generally they're looking for them to walk to the main roads. Sure. Um, I can't comment on it specifically, but I would think as a matter of personal and somewhat professional opinion, having worked with projects somewhat similar to these over the years, given the caliber of the housing uh, as affordable housing and workforce housing, it's more than likely that there will be younger children younger yeah. families in a situation like this. Now, I understand from having children of our own that uh, bus routes change annually. There's probably going to be enough with the 13 lots in here that might make it conducive for the school board to, uh, to agree. I don't know what all their criteria is, but to actually have the bus go through the neighborhood. That's what we were looking at doing. Yeah. Um, if it ends up changing, you know, it's conceivable certainly that we could have a bus turn out there. It's even possible that, uh, and now I'm just reaching, um, is that uh, this area is actually fairly wide. You can see there's sort of a, well, you can't see it on your drawings probably, but on this one, there's already basically a little turnout right here. Yeah. Um, we were involved in the uh, um, engineering and surveying for the bridge that was going over the turnpike years ago when the turnpike was being widened. And this area is actually flatter than wider than you would expect. Uh, and it's continually maintained by the uh, main turnpike, even though this is DOT property, this road is maintained by uh, the turnpike authority. The point being is that it's hardly ever used and uh, it would be conducive to being able to have a little turnout right in here if that's something that uh, the buses need to take advantage of. Yeah. It, it may be curious just to do a little bit of a line of sight up the hill. Oh, we've done that. So. Okay, we've got a traffic report that you don't have with you now because it's only a sketch plan, but we yep. do have that uh, already completed. Okay. Good. Anything else you need from us? Uh, if that's the extent of the comments, I appreciate that. <coughs> that's what we came for. Thank you. We like it. Thank you very much. Can't wait to see more. Thanks. Our next item this evening is Ringney Farm Subdivision, Risbera's Brother Construction, requests a sketch plan review for a 13-lot residential subdivision off Highland Avenue in the R2 zone. Mr. Chase. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as you just noted, this application is in the R2 zone, which is one of the lower density zones in, in town and is one of the areas that does require a conservation subdivision if certain thresholds are met. And in this instance, that's one of the thresholds is being met in that the property has greater than one acre of wetlands on it. Therefore, um, a couple of things need to come into play in, in the design criteria. One is that 50% of the land needs to be maintained as open space. And the other uh, component is that within the R2, uh, subdivisions need to be sewered. Um, and so uh, we will ask the applicants to provide a overview of what their considerations are in, in that approach. Um, one thing I'd also like to note is while the lot is predominantly R2, there are little sections or modest sections of industrial as well as RF, sort of an interesting confluence there. But um, 
And so I just uh, I think it's important that as the applicant sort of moves forward with their net residential calculations and sort of laying out the lot area that we sort of uh, readily identify those lot areas, how much is an industrial, or take that out of the net res calculations since you can't have residential and the industrial, and just sort of work through the calculations based on the percentage of lot in, within each zone. Mm -hmm. So we just ask that you think about that moving forward. Um, in terms of design, um, staff just questions uh, or the board and applicant might want to think about, you know, if there's merit to considering um, connecting the proposed cul-de-sac and looping it, sort of like what we just saw, frankly, with the, um, with the, what's being, right now there's a, um, I should step back, there's a uh, existing private way um, that accesses the back, called the back red uh, rectangle we're looking at the house. There's a private way, and they're proposing to maintain a portion of that as private way for frontage for that lot. Uh, staff just questions if there's merit to consider looping. There may not be, given the extent of the proposal, but certainly it's something worthy of discussion anyway. Um, in looking at this, you know, uh, the board and applicant might want to consider, the, given the scale of development, um, street design, merits of street width, sidewalks. I know uh, on a recent uh, uh, subdivision in, in this area, uh, Settlers Green 2, there was provision for sidewalks connecting to Highland Avenue, and that may be considered to be incorporated into this development. Um, then just the other, one other item based on a, a pre-meeting discussion that staff had with the applicants. Um, we understand that they're considering doing some, some grading and berming along Highland Avenue, sort of along the back of the lots that uh, have frontage on Highland Avenue, but will actually gain their access off the proposed uh, public or proposed, proposed street. Um, and they, as I said, they're considering doing some significant grading and berming in that area. And so maybe the applicant can, can just uh, bring the board up to speed with what's being considered there. So I know that's something they are pretty interested in moving forward with sooner than later, given that they have. Um, the Riz Barrers brothers have quite a bit of uh, stockpile that they are looking that this is where they want to put it and they want to move it. <laughs> so uh, it may be worth starting that conversation now um, and seeing what could be done with that. Um, with that, uh, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Fisher, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Jim Fisher, Northeast Civil. Uh, here this evening representing the uh, Risbara Brothers or Risbara uh, Brothers Construction. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be able to work with Risbara in many respects. Uh, over the years, we've established quite a, a lengthy relationship. In one respect, I'll point out to use this as an example. We could actually, based on the density of the, uh, the district in which this is located, get 23 lots in here. Risbara's are developers. They have chosen to take the higher road, as it were, and said, we don't need 23 lots. Let's cut this down and make this more attuned to the lots, generally speaking, that are in the overall character of the, um, of the neighborhood uh, from around Pleasant Hill Road, both sides. And toward that end, we, uh, we nearly cut those in half uh, and increased the size of the development of the lots, even though uh, those lots could actually be reduced by about two-thirds of what you see there right now. So toward that end, it's a big feather in their cap saying we're not just into uh, uh, cutting and running. They live here. They work here. And uh, this is a great company with which to do business. Toward that end, uh, let me just a bit of orientation. What we see here, Pleasant Hill Road is essentially right here. Uh, comes out to Route 1 down the way down here in the fire station. Pleasant Hill Fire Station is right about over here. Coming down Highland Avenue, there is a Banneger Way, which is the private road that is in existence right over here. What we're proposing to do, and this is pursuant to uh, comments that we had from uh, staff earlier, uh, is make this the road, and this is basically tantamount to a driveway. Uh, it's because it's only going to be serving one house, which is this one that is not part of the subdivision, by the way. Uh, we keep it as a private way because, as Jay mentioned, that's where the frontage came from in legal frontage. We can't make something more non-conforming. So that will stay here, but it is essentially a driveway. That kind of gets to the, the looped concept. They had requested that we not do a specific loop. Uh, with a significant amount of traffic given what's there right now, uh, relative to what's there right now that would be coming by their front yard. It's obviously up to the board, but that was a request by the individuals who uh, uh, own the property. And, uh, and I don't see that there's any problem with that. We are far under the minimum that we have as far as the length of the road is concerned, and it works rather well. 
one of the things as far as the orientation is concerned too that Jay brought up earlier is that um, whether it's DPW or driven by whomever, there is a request to be able to do, if we have a cul-de-sac, uh, sort of the number nine looking cul-de-sac, where instead of coming up to the bulb at the end, it would come up uh, similar to what we just saw in the previous project, where it comes straight up and then kind of loops back on itself and it looks like a number nine. Uh, we don't have any problem with that. I'm not sure that it's really germane to anything that's uh, requiring that over any other design, but um, if that's a significant uh, item that any member of the staff or um, uh, public services in Scarborough, then we can certainly accommodate that. That's not a big issue. Again, these lots are oversized relative to what they need to be, so we have some room to be able to play with that. As far as the zones are concerned, this is actually a conception <coughs> based on a uh, retracement survey that we had uh, surveys from around the area. We have subsequently surveyed out the entire property and we've got this down to the square foot. Uh, it's very close to what you see right here, meaning these uh, outer parameter lot lines. But to answer Jay's question, we have the specifics now about the, the amount of square footage that's in these respective zones and we will show that to you when we're back next time. We do not propose to take advantage of anything that is, the zones by the way are, uh, this is one of the zones down here, this is another portion of the zone up here and then uh, the industrial and then the uh, farm and four, or the uh, uh, RF zone and then the R2 zone. So we're proposing to keep everything in the residential zone and not go near the, uh, the others. Uh, so we shouldn't have any problems toward that end. Uh, as far as the uh, connection to sewer service, it will be uh, public water and sewer in that area. Uh, the Risbars will be bringing that uh, connection down to the area and we're proposing to have each individual lot have its own push station, which is very common. That will uh, push into the force main, which will then go up to uh, Highland Avenue and then down Highland Avenue uh, for treatment. Uh, water the same way. There's already water in that area actually, so we'll we be able to just run the water lines right in there and everybody will have uh, uh, public utilities and everything will be subgrade again. Uh, looping the dead end road, again we propose not to actually loop that based on the uh, uh, suggestion of the people that own the property. Um, we can do the, uh, the number nine cul-de-sac uh, design if we need to, it's certainly okay. Uh, designing the uh, uh, reduced width of the road, we would like to take advantage of that as we had, as I mentioned previously on the other project. Uh, we would like to be able to go down to uh, 20 feet of pavement as opposed to the normally uh, accepted 22 feet that's allowed in this particular district. So that will help. Again, that's not narrowing the overall road, it's just narrowing the surface coating of the traveled way. So from a fire department perspective, there should be no issues as far as the subgrade materials are concerned. Uh, sidewalk and street trees, uh, street trees we have no issue, it's a field right now or the predominance of it so we can certainly put some street trees in there. Sidewalk, just to be very honest, we're just not sure a sidewalk in this particular case is necessary. Uh, there's a finite number of lots, there will not be any more or lots than the ones that you see here, it can't go any further. Um, toward that end it's a very uh, suburban type of atmosphere, most of the people who are in there are going to be the ones that are living there only. Uh, so we're just not sure that, uh, that the sidewalk is really going to do anything. We do understand that there's a the sidewalk from Sutler's Green that comes out to Highland Avenue. Uh, that particular subdivision or series of subdivisions has, please don't quote me on this, but probably close to 70 or 80 homes in that. This has got 13. Um, we just don't think that that is something that is really going to be conducive to anything positive in this particular area. Uh, but we're open to suggestion. And then as far as um, providing for the buffering along Highland Avenue. Uh, as Jay mentioned, there's bars are planning to do that anyway. There's already a small berm there that's right, ne right now. It's going to be augmented. Uh, we would not like to camouflage the entire development, but we would certainly like to be able to put enough landscaping across that berm uh, to be able to break it up a little bit so that anybody who is traveling Highland Avenue, which is a bit of a corridor to be sure, it's not a major arterial, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of traffic there and uh, we do plan to be able to augment that berm with quite a number of plantings that will kind of break up the landscape a bit and uh, help everyone as far as uh, anything from noise and safety to uh, camouflaging a bit of the uh, development from the roadway. Given that, we're just looking again for, we'll be back soon uh, with this one with the fully engineered plans and toward that end, any other comments that the board members might have or questions you've got, please, now's the time. Oh. Okay. Uh, Jim, help me. Lots A and B as part of the project? Yes. Okay. So
so that private way you I guess where does the new road start? Uh, the new road's actually going to start right at this intersect, this sort of Y intersection right here. So between point A and point B where the new road starts is a private way? Well, this is all a private, oh, you mean as we're proposing it to go forward? Yeah. Yes. It's just this section that will remain the private way right here. That will remain, but going into the, the structure to start with, is, is that's going to be private, right? Oh, is that going to start the road right there? No, right this will start the road. That will start the road. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't get that on, on here. Okay, okay and, the, and, the, and then that other section will remain a private way. Um, lot 7, how are you going to get into the, into the structure? Where, where's going to be the entrance yeah, from, from the cul-de-sac? Oh, right off the edge of the cul-de-sac. Right okay, so right, right directly in. Yes. Okay. Um, Talked about the sewer service and reduced vote with. I think you've hit all I want for the time being, so I'll pass on to my fellow board members. Susan? Uh, why is it A and B and not um, 12 and 13? There's only one with a house. Um, and the one that is private is the fellow who sold the land. Well, this is actually these. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. yeah, I got it. Okay. I got it. Um, it just seems odd to me that we have 11 and we have A and B. Thank <coughs> you, Susan. I appreciate that. That's what confused me. Yeah. Sure, we can certainly change that. Yeah. Ostensibly, they were, these were labeled this way because this house I is understand. currently for sale, and this one they want to recapitalize on soon. Okay. So I'm confused again. Let's go to the right-hand side of this. Is this lot, does this, this, this subdivision and goes to the dotted line red or to the dotted line blue? Uh, the subdivision is, the, the parameters of the subdivision or the perimeter basically of the land follow the dotted line blue. Okay. So what's going to happen to all of the green that is now RF and all of the uh, industrial? That is wetland. It is wetland? This area. Right here. This is all of course it is. It's on Highland Avenue. So where this subdivision is going in is essentially going to take up what we now know as the field. Yes. Okay. Which takes me to the note down here that says, this is an arterial. Excuse me. This is most of the traffic, soapbox time, most of the traffic that goes through Oak Hill early in the morning and later in the afternoon are people coming from the south to South Portland, and they go right down Highland Avenue. Very, very, very busy. Of course you do. There's a lot of traffic. It could be. But <clears throat> another nice thing about it is that in the fall it's spectacular. It is a spectacular drive. And one of the nice things about that spectacular drive is you go by this lovely garden. I understand. If I can't go there. Huh? <laughs> Actually, where I'm going I is understand. the berm is a great idea. Hopefully, and, and, I mean, Rocky Risperra said to me once, Susan, I can do anything with dirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's true. So I would like to see all of this wonderful stuff he's going to bring in be sort of, you know, sure. undulating with trees. Yes. They don't have to be trees that are going to block the view, but different varieties of healthy green all year round. Okay. Yes, this is a that project take, that called out That would be really that. great because that will take the um, sadness out of losing the farmland. Oh, well. Um, okay. The, the loop does not, it's not important to me. I don't know whether it is to staff, but it's not to me. Street trees is a great idea. Again, anything to help um, one of my biggest problems with all those developments up around Pleasant Hill where there used to be great big farms when I was a child um, are now all houses and there's just houses and the, the, even when the landscaping grows there's still going to be houses with landscaping on a, on a field. So the idea of putting in street trees right from the beginning I think is very important. Um, I don't think that the sidewalk needed there either. It doesn't seem important to me. 
but I think other than that, I applaud the fact that the lots are going to be larger than is necessary. That's a wonderful thing to see. Um, open space up above, it's got primarily it's got some wetland on it, but they're just keeping it open space because it's hard to get to. Mm, no, we could have made it incorporated in part of the lot. We just chose not to. Oh, I love it. This is wonderful. So it's going to be open space as part <coughs> of the, uh, there'll, there'll have to be some kind of a neighborhood, what is it called? Um, An association that will maintain that. it, yes. Is that going to be open space green and that's going to be part of the, of the covenants as well? Not just, that's labeled open space. Is this labeled open space down here? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The whole thing is going to be open space. This is very good. This is very good. Okay. I think it's, um, I cry, but at the same time, as I say, there's hope. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Nick? I am I am fine with the road design not looping around. I have this okay in my book. Um, small neighborhood like this, I, I agree, probably does not need sidewalks. Street trees are great. Road width is fine with me at 20 feet as long as the fire department is happy. And uh, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, the concern for the person on the private way not wanting a loop road, and I agree with that. Uh, I think sidewalks is a good idea. No, I, I'm sorry. I, I, th I agree with you that sidewalks are not necessary in this project. Um, I'm okay with the cul-de-sac. Um, street trees would be nice, especially considering that this whole area is just an open field. Right. Is there a reason why lots the the boundary lines for lots four, five, and six were not extended to that red line. Is it the, is it the wetlands? Yes. Okay. Wetlands in the buffer there, from. What about access to the open space? Um, Besides walking down Highland Avenue. Sure. Um, we don't actually show that on the plan, but we can certainly make an access that would, for instance, be like between lot four and five or something. Yeah. Um, it opens up the area, to be sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's all I hear. I'm good. Everybody said everything I wanted to You're say. Good. All right. So much like you're thinking about some access space between 4 and 5, how about doing the same thing between 8 and 7 to the to the space, the up open here? space up above? Yeah. Sure. No issue. Okay. Um, I... I guess I'm a sidewalk kind of guy. I'd prefer to see one. Uh, berms are good. I, I'm a little confused in terms of how we're calculating the frontage, the road frontage for the the existing house on the private way. And and in this one right here, or, or this one? Yeah, that one. Be, the way the the way the lot is, I guess I'm not exactly sure how that, where that is a private way, I'm not sure how the road frontage comes into play as part of the subdivision. So I guess I'd kind of like you to huddle with Jay on that one and come up with how that's being calculated because it just doesn't add up to me. So I'm not sure I understand you. Well, the, the, when I, I think, mean, go ahead. The, the frontage is the existing boundaries, and I think uh, Mr. Fisher, for everyone here, right there, those two points that Mr. Fisher has pointed to, there to there, that's their frontage. That's on, there. They, there's currently an approved private way plan out there, and that's how that lot has frontage. So they, those are current lot lines, and those aren't changing. Okay. Uh, and keep in mind that that lot is not part of the subdivision. That's a, a separate ownership completely than the rest of this land. We don't have any control over that. All right. A little confusing, but okay. Everybody else is happy, so I'm, <laughs> I'll let it go. Uh, you talked about the utilities, the 20-foot pavement I'm all set with. Um, we spoke earlier this evening about 
markers to delineate the no disturb area for uh, toward the wetlands. I'm yes. assuming you're going to do that again. Yes. So let that go. Um, the only other thing is, and, and, and I'm sure that you probably did that, but if you haven't, make sure that your circumferences on the cul-de-sac where we're going to a 20-foot wide roadway are still okay with the fire department. Yes. Um, the, the right of way will still be the 50-foot rag requirement. So we're not, while we're narrowing up, and I understand your question, we'll yeah. certainly put that, we have to anyway, or run it by the fire okay. chief, but uh, the actual radii, the curve radii will be the same in any situation. Just the pavement on which they're driving will be a little bit narrower. Okay. But again, they have these shoulders that if two fire trucks have to pass in the night kind of thing, they can go off the pavement and still stay up on the road, as it were. It just, the appearance seems, it's a visual. So I just wanted to make sure we got we got that. Yep. Correct. Outside of that, again, lighting or anything like that, are you thinking about or no? Um, we're looking at one light again that will be uh, need to have uh, right down here. At, yeah, at, at the at the roadway. Yep. We were not planning on any other lighting in this area. Okay. There's actually over this hill. Um, you get down into the uh, uh, yard. Yeah, my adder's in there. That's pretty lighted down there. Not necessarily conducive to uh, what we would normally like. All right. And and no, uh, no, tr in that northernmost open space, no trails or anything, no connectivity there that you're aware of. Uh, connectivity to any uh, anywhere else. This section you're talking about. Right? Yes. Right. That's all I have, Jim. Okay, thank you. Chairman? Yes. Uh, can I just ask something? That road will become a uh, public road? Yes, that's the intent. And the pavement will be 20 feet wide? That is also by, the intent. About a 50 foot right away? Yes. Um, so the idea is to still be able to get two fire trucks going? Yes, the overall width of the quote unquote traveled way will be what it always is intended as a public right or as a public street. The pavement or the traveled way portion of that can be narrowed down as long as the shoulders, which you may not even, you meaning anybody, may not even see because the provision allows for the subgrade materials to be able to build up to support an 80,000 pound pump truck, but you can actually loam over the top of that, not that it will be, but we can, um, up to several, up to three inches. Uh, and that makes it look much more rural in character. From an aesthetic standpoint, it just looks a lot cooler. But the fire trucks know that if they have to then segue off the road because they're passing or, or whatever, that they're not going to get mired in April in the mud 
and roll over, that they're going to have a solid base beneath them. So it looks a lot better. It's still pr plenty wide. I, I appreciate that, but my question is probably to uh, Jay. What what happens when you have four foot snow banks on each side of that pavement? I'll have a conversation with the public works director in the fire department. Would they, on, on would the, they go in and, and plow? We'll talk about later. the road width. We haven't talked about that detail yet. So when there's a formal application, um, certainly the public works director and fire department will weigh in on as to if they think that 20 foot is adequate or not. And that's yeah. typically who we yeah. turn to and look okay. for their guidance as to what they're comfortable with from an operation and maintenance standpoint. Because yeah. um, that, you know, snow might defeat the purpose of this whole thing. Well, that's no, that's a very good point. That snow can be um, plowed further back, keeping in mind that Usually um, if the loam, if they do choose to loam up to the actual edge of the pavement, we're looking at a, uh, albeit slight, but a crowned road, so that as far as the, the blades are concerned, they can actually extend the blades to three feet beyond the edge of the pavement on both sides without ripping up any of the soil because, again, it drops, I'm oversimplifying, but it drops off fairly significantly that way. Okay. So it does work. And then if any repair is necessary, you know, in <coughs> the springtime, then just make it. Okay. Thanks. Any other comments or questions of what you'd like to see? I think we're good. All right. You got everything you need? I do. Thank nice. you very much. Nice. Thanks for spending the evening with us. The next time beverages or something like that would be appropriate. Cheese and crackers. Oh, is that to me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can do. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, town planner's report. Sure. I have a couple of items to bring to the board's attention. One. Um, we have received an application for Lot 7 on Scarborough Gallery, which the board has seen as a sketch plan. We've received a pre-application submission, so we are beginning our staff review of that. So I would anticipate they'll either be on the board's next agenda or the subsequent agenda. But they mm -hmm. are likely coming forward pretty soon. Um, you probably have noticed a lot of work out there in their preloading that we talked about earlier in the winter. Um, two other items I just want to bring to the well, one one item I want to bring to the board's attention. You should receive, I believe, an email from me or Dan Bacon regarding a meeting on May 8th, all committees meeting at six o'clock at the uh, let's see, middle school cafe. Um, so if you folks are able to make it, um, that would be great. Uh, the other item I want to talk about is our next meeting is May 12th. Um, the, that is a Monday, but the irregular thing about it is we will be meeting at the middle school cafe because we're cafeteria, I'm sorry. We are um, being usurped by voting in this room. So we'll be down at the middle school in the cafeteria. Uh, we had also talked about having a workshop on that prior to that meeting. Um, and again, I want to, I know Mr. Mazur, I believe, has indicated he will not be able to attend. But he don't, won't be at the meeting. But don't, don't, but, if everybody else can make it then. Yep. By all means. So I just wanted to get a general sense of the rest of the board. If May 12th was still on your radar and still seemed doable for a Fine. you know get together at five or five thirty, what have you, well, details will be vetted here shortly. But seeing not the head, so good. Thank you. I want my pictures sometime after that. Though. We'll, we'll save you a piece for when you get back. That's Mother's Day weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, bring them on down. Mother's Day is Sunday. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember my schedule. So if I have an issue, I'll get back take, to you. Take a look at your calendar. Yep. Um, let us know as soon as possible. We can certainly find another day. Um, that's what I have for my town finance report. Thank you very much. Administrative amendment report. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember. I, I, the last one I recall is the outdoor display at the Chad Little, and I can't Done remember it. if we had... That was that was, that was that Mr. Bacon okay. handled that for All you. Right. We're good with that one. Thank Any you. correspondence? No. Planning board comments. Mr. Mazur. I'd just like to follow up on uh, what I said a couple of minutes ago. Transportation committee. Um, 